The following interview is being conducted with Mark Shaw for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It takes place on September 15th, 2021, online via Zoom. The interviewer is Beth McNeil, Dean of Library Services and School of Information Studies, and Esther Ellis Norton, Professor of Library Science. Here with me today is Mark Shaw, a Purdue graduate uh, who will talk to us about his time at Purdue, his early life in Indiana, and what has happened to him since he left Purdue with his exciting career. In 2020, Mark Shaw worked with the University Archives at Purdue University to deposit his archival material. His collection joins many collections in archives and we're delighted to have it. Mark graduated from Purdue in 1968, went on to receive a law degree and to have a career which we will hear more about today. Shaw is a member of the Indiana and California Bar and the International George Bernard Shaw Society. So Mark, tell us a little bit about where you're from. Well, thank you. First, this is such an honor because uh, back in 1968 or 1963, you know, to 68, when I was at Auburn, Indiana, the small town I'll talk about, and then, you know, came to Purdue, I could have never imagined anything like this. So I'm so thankful for Purdue uh, honoring me with the, uh, with the archival depository of my body of work and all of that. Uh, yes, I came from a very small town, uh, Auburn, Indiana, uh, up by Fort Wayne, uh, probably th about 3,000 people, I think. Uh, I grew up there. Uh, Auburn is, is famous in some ways because that's where the old Auburn Cords, Duesenbergs, and all that cars were manufactured back in the 20s and 30s. And uh, it, they, in fact, they have a parade every year now honoring those cars and all of that. And so I came from a small town, uh, my mother and father, uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mother. Uh, my father uh, worked at a uh, manufacturing plant, but then uh, I learned a great deal from him because he was never satisfied with that job. And, and that marks uh, a lot of what happened to me through my career after Purdue and all of that. Uh, he decided to become a realtor. Uh, he studied at night, I remember him doing that. And I remember my father also saying, Mark, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're the smartest person in the world or not. So uh, you just need to work harder than everybody. And that lesson stayed with me uh, all the way through uh, up and even till today. So my dad became a realtor. Uh, he got so prosperous that uh, he finally ran for mayor. He was unsuccessful. There's even a Shaw edition in Auburn, Indiana, uh, where they built some homes and all of that. So I had wonderful upbringing from my mother and father. I had a brother and a sister. We'll talk about my brother in a minute and another sister. And so um, it was a wonderful place to grow up. Uh, I've moved around. We'll talk about that. I've moved around to so many places in this country, but I've never forgotten uh, my Hoosier years because I've never found as wonderful a people any place uh, I've lived, uh, people you can rely on, people that uh, you can trust and all of that as I did in Indiana. Uh, my days at Auburn uh, were, were probably, uh, there was nothing distinguished about them. Uh, although uh, I began uh, a stream of uh, being a terrible student in, 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 in Auburn. Uh, I believe that if my uh, English teacher, Mrs. Fincham, that I can remember, who gave me a D in English, would have had any idea today that I have published almost 30 books and a best-selling author and all of that, she would turn over in her grave, probably in excitement, but wondering if, she, if, if I'm the right Mark Shaw or not, because I was a terrible student there. Um, looked upon a little bit, I think, at times as a bit of an oddball. I like to try new things. Uh, some others always made fun of that, but I tried to do that. Uh, I probably am the only one who graduated from uh, Auburn High School who actually got a D in driver's ed as well because I was a terrible driver. And during uh, uh, our, our being out in one of the driver's ed cars, I actually made a wrong turn and hit the cement around a YMCA. And, and that particular uh, teacher uh, laughed at it, but uh, it basically had to give me a D. He was also the golf coach at Auburn High School. And I did find that I had an ability in golf. And so Mr. Ford uh, had to give me a D. He would have given me an F, uh, but um, he wanted to keep me on the golf team. So Auburn, Indiana, uh, close to Fort Wayne, a uh, small town, small town guy. Uh, 
I think we went to Chicago maybe two or three times, but I had never gotten out in the world, never had to take care of myself and everything. And so when it came time in 1963 to go to college, um, I ended up going to Purdue. And uh, the way that that happened is that back then, uh, if you wanted to go to a state school in Indiana, they pretty much had to take you. That meant pretty much IU and, and Purdue, uh, probably some others as well. But despite my grades being very poor, I got into Purdue. And why did I go there? Well, I had a brother, Jack, who's five years older than me. And Jack went to Purdue to become an engineer. And uh, I, I, I'm so proud of him because, uh, Beth, he, uh, he worked really hard. He was a smart guy and, and all of that. And uh, he ended up getting a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, not only that, but Jack got in on the, um, the real first times that they did anything with space communications or all of that. And uh, Jack ended up uh, going with a firm that was involved in that area, all the way to really becoming at one point president of Direct TV, if you can imagine that. And so Jack was the smart one in the family, I believe, although my sister was that way too. But I wanted to emulate my brother and go to Purdue and become an electrical engineer. And this is a pretty good story because I think it will inspire anybody who watches this, uh, this uh, presentation, this interview, this video. Uh, I'm not the smartest person that ever lived as, as indicated by the grades, but one way or another, I learned lessons at Purdue. I got there, uh, I lived in Cary Hall. I don't know if it's there uh, still or not. I uh, had a roommate that I remember, Dave Weibel, and we lived there. And uh, I had to wear a green beanie at the time, a little green beanie that I had to put on my hat to show that I was a freshman so the upperclassmen could, could uh, make fun of us. And uh, so I was there. As a matter of fact, it's interesting because you had to take reserve officer training, what was called ROTC. And you had to take this reserve off officer training. And I did it with the Air Force. I had a little blue uniform that I wore and everything. And one thing that happened during that time at Cary is I was sitting in my dorm room on November 22nd, 1963, when John F. Kennedy, the president, was assassinated. I don't remember what my, uh, my reaction was. I'm sure I felt very, very badly. I cried, I'm sure, and all of that. But as you'll see, it's amazing how that experience with learning about the JFK assassination comes all the way around to the most recent books that I've, that I've written. But while at Purdue, I had these great aspirations of being an engineer like my brother, and then I took a physics 152 course. I don't know if it's still there, but you had to take physics and chemistry and all this kind of thing. And so I studied really hard, as hard as I could, and went in to take this, uh, this test in an auditorium. I always remember uh, other students around me, and when we got the test, they were opening all the pages and, and answering questions, and I got the first page, and I turned it. I didn't know anything, and then the second and the third and all of that. So true story, um, the way you got your grade on that test was to wait a few days and it would be posted on a bulletin board in the physics department. So I went there and I went down and I looked at Mark Shaw and beside there was a five. I actually got a five out of a hundred on that test. Well, I was just decimated, cried, call my father on the phone. I'm a failure. I'm all this. And I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not smart enough to be at Purdue because Purdue. Purdue had a great reputation back then, just as it is, does today. You know, I, I want to say that, that you know, there, there are those names of universities, Purdue, Stanford, MIT, uh, other ones, maybe Northwestern, other ones, Michigan. But Purdue has always had that reputation for excellence. And so that was always a badge of courage for me that I went to Purdue, but I was going to quit. Well, I went in to see the professor uh, of that particular course. And I don't remember the man's name, but God love him. I always will remember what he told me. I said, you know, I'm thinking of dropping out of college. Oh, I just get a little teary eyed when I think about if I had done that. But he said to me, Mark, if you quit now, you'll be a quitter your whole life. And that has stayed with me throughout my life. You'll be a quitter your whole life if you quit now. So what I did is I talked to my dad on the phone. He said, I said, dad, I just don't know if I'm cut out for this to be an engineer. He said, oh, Mark, we knew you'd never be an engineer. Why don't you drop out of that and get into something that you, sh you can do? And so uh, there was a, co a curriculum at the time called industrial management. I think it's still there. I took uh, industrial management and uh, it was tough enough for me, uh, Beth, because it took me almost six years to graduate. 
Uh, I wasn't a serious student. I didn't study very hard. Back then, I don't know if you have it now, but we had the six-point system. So my grade point average when I finally graduated in 1968, I think was a 4.1. Uh, just, just barely made it through. But Purdue really uh, uh, helped me grow up. Uh, that's what I remember about Purdue. Everything that I've ever accomplished in my life came from Purdue University and what I learned, but not as much in the classroom as it did out of the classroom. Uh, my brother had been a Beta Theta Pi, uh, a member of the Beta Theta Pi fraternity. Well, they called you legacies back then. So when I was interviewed by, by the people at Beta Theta Pi, uh, they had to kind of take me as a, as a pledge. And I was looking not too long ago at a pledge picture of me there. And I think it was indicative of the kind of person that I was at the time because I was getting out of my, of my closed society in, in Auburn and now at Purdue University and all of that with, I don't know how many students, there were probably 40, 50,000 students, but I was learning about growing up and taking care of myself and all of that. And that pledge picture has three rows of the pledge, uh, the pledge brothers and in the front row by myself is me. And I think that's indicative of my rebelistic type of, of future that I had, of always uh, being kind of on my own and trying new things and, and, and not being worried about uh, going after things, even though they may have seemed almost impossible at the time. But Beta Theta Pi was a wonderful experience for me. I think it's still over on Littleton Street, which is huge, huge home. Uh, uh, back built many, many years earlier. We had the dorms and all of that. But being a brother in that fraternity was a huge situation for me. I, I still have those fraternity brothers today. I can say, by the way, when they heard that Purdue was going to honor me with this archival collection, uh, they thought maybe they had the wrong Mark Shaw because they remember me, many of them never studying, never doing anything. And in fact, I just recently found a photograph uh, of me uh, in my fifth year there uh, th three paternity brothers and I uh, re-rented a, a basement in a small home near Beta Theta Pi fraternity. And uh, it, it wasn't much, and, and it was in it, very, very bad shape. We didn't take care of it or anything. In fact, my mother came down and made one trip to that basement and said she'd never come back, and she never did, God bless her. But anyway, the, the photograph shows uh, one of my fraternity brothers on the phone. It's a rotary phone. One of my fraternity brothers' girlfriend. And then there's me with my back to the camera. I don't have a shirt on. I don't have socks on. I don't have uh, shoes on. And I'm sitting there, and it looks like I'm maybe studying, which could be a possibility. But right next to me is a can, either full or not, a beer can. So I was having a good time then, and we used to have parties there and all of that. I got to know other people on the campus. At the time, the most famous Purdue man was Bob Greasy, who became a, uh, was the quarterback on the football team, finally with the Miami Dolphins, won a, won a championship, an NFL championship. But I got to know him because we lived about uh, two blocks away from the Sigma Chi house. And some of my brothers knew him better than I did, you know, uh, because they were in sports. But uh, they were going to the Kentucky Derby. And just a quick story, we went down there, and because Bob was a celebrity, when we went up to take our funds, I think we have $100 between about 10 of us. We had $100 to bet on a horse. And so we went up to the, uh, the, where you would, you would make the bet, and we let Bob do it. And we heard the guy say, wait a minute, you're Bob Greasy. And he said, well, yes, I am. He said, well, let me help you guys a little with your bets. So we went ahead and, and Bob did that, and I'll be darned, we won the first race and the two or three after that, and finally our $100 had turned into almost $500, which in 1968 was a lot of money. And we said we ought to quit, and Bob said, no, let's try one more race. So we went, he went up to the, where you made the bets, and he bet on a horse, I'll never forget the name, Banana Joe, Banana Joe. So we, we're all excited. We go watch the race. And what happens? Banana Joe goes out of the gate, leading everything. And about halfway down the first turn, he turns around and goes backwards toward the starting gate. Well, obviously, he did not win that race. We did not win any more money. We lost it all. And after that, nobody could figure out we called Bob Greasy Banana Joe Greasy. And it was so much fun. But that was what Purdue was all, for, all, all about for me. I even wrest, uh, referee uh, a wrestling match before a, a famous uh, wrestler named Dick the Bruiser 
who was famous at the time, um, had the main event. And later on, I'll tell a little story about how the bruiser came into my life, back into my life when I was a criminal defense lawyer. But it was an amazing time for me. And yeah, I think people thought I was a little bit of an oddball then. I would try different things. Some people in that day will say Mark Shaw probably was the worst dressed guy I ever knew at Purdue. I'm probably still that way with my khakis and everything. But I actually sold clothes over uh, in a store by Harry's Chocolate Shop at one time. I bartended a pig and whistle when I wasn't even really old enough to do so. So I hope that what people will see who, who watch this video that are going to Purdue is live the full life there. And, and yes, in the classroom, you should study because you need to really do that to, to get ahead these days. But live the life, the social life. It bothers me today, unfortunately, that we have to do the the uh, you know the classes now uh, you know without the the, the the students being on campus or even being in the classrooms because so much of college and I'm hoping Purdue is getting back to normal that way is all about the things you learn out of the classroom. But it was a wonderful time for for me at Purdue, and as I say, uh, my years at Purdue are responsible for everything that happened after that. Thank you so much, Mark. That was very, um, very informative. And you've answered some of our questions about your time here at Purdue, but I just want to clarify, you were here from 1963 to 1968. Mm -hmm. studying and some summer schools. I studied in the summers. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, industrial management, ultimately, as Correct. your major. Great. Um, I love the story of the physics professor and how he helped you to oh, think yes. about staying. Yes. We know you lived in Cary Hall. Um, where, in fact, still, Kerry Hall is still here. Uh -huh. And then you had some uh, time at the fraternity house. And then you also lived in an off-campus basement apartment. Um, okay, great. You've told us some great memories about your time here. Tell me again where you were a bartender that was at the Pig and... It was called the Pig and Whistle, I believe. And uh, the fraternity, if, if people uh, want to look... Uh, it was on a, a huge, uh, I don't know if you call it a hill, not a mountain, but a hill over on Littleton Street. And then it looked down into Lafayette. And so there was a highway that went across and down there were restaurants and, and bars and things like that. And I believe it was called the Pig and Whistle. It had peanut shells on the floor. And I bartended there for a while, which will come back into a play when I end up being in Chicago. So uh, in fact, a lot of things that happened at Purdue kind of duplicated themselves as I went through life. But yes, I bartended there and then I sold those clothes. I was even salesman of the month one time at the uh, at the clothing store. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. That's great. And that's a, a perfect segue into um, the, the next stage of your life, leaving Purdue and everything that you've been up to since then. So I'm going to turn to you. I have some questions along the way, but please go ahead and tell us about uh, what came next. Well, you know, I thought about it the other day. It's it's kind of the fact that I, I suppose the uh, if you wanted to look at, at some label for what happened to me in my life, I always was interested in the truth. Um, my father told me to always tell the truth. Uh, Mark, it, no matter what, you know, you're, you're gonna you're gonna be known for for the truth regarding your reputation. Get a reputation for telling the truth. So. I've told people at times with interviews and things about the book that I kind of pursued, you know, uh, the truth with a with a life full of adventures in many ways that are that are in some ways too strange for anybody that's sane to believe. And they all started after I left Purdue. The first thing that dawned on me that that happened that was kind of unusual in kind of a serendipitous way was the fact that. In 1968, what was every young man who was graduating from college worried about? Going to Vietnam. And I was all ready to go. There were young men who were actually shooting, shooting themselves in the foot so that they could be injured and all of that. But I felt a duty. My dad told me, you, you need to do your duty. So I went down to Indianapolis um, and, uh, and, and took the physical. And uh, I went through the line and I, everything in my shorts and all that. And I came up to the last person and he was a very gruff sergeant. He said, well, you flunk the hearing test, Mr. Shaw, but we have people who fake that. So you'll need to come back the next day. So I, I stayed in Indianapolis. I went back the next day and I flunked the hearing test again. Now I should say, I've never had any problem with hearing 
hearing in my life. I didn't have it with, at that time, but somehow or another, I flanked the, te flanked the test. And this sergeant said to me, Mr. Shaw, you cannot enlist, you cannot be drafted. Uh, now get the hell out of here. And so I did. And I actually went to the telephone in the hall and called my father and said, my, uh, Dad, there's a mistake here. And he said to me, it's one of the few times I ever heard him cuss. You get the hell out of there, Mark. You get out of there. I was classified. I think it was 4F at the time. And I just couldn't believe it because I knew. And, I, and I've always, I must say, felt guilty about that, that I didn't have to serve. I don't know what would have happened to me if I'd had to go to, to uh, Vietnam. I, I might have lost my life there. But it was a defining moment in my life because everything could have changed. And I'm so thankful that it did, but I've always felt rather guilty about it. So what did I do? Well, uh, again, Purdue helped me find a job. And I got a job with a chemical company despite my terrible grades. I went up to Michigan. I trained. And then they sent me to Minnesota. And the, the job actually, the title of the job wasn't great. And the job wasn't great either. It was selling uh, truck, uh, a car, uh, railroad cars full of uh, sulfuric acid to um, manufacturers. Well, if that doesn't sound very exciting, it wasn't. And it only took me about six months to get fired. I got fired from my very first job I had. I was very disappointed. I remember the, my, my uh, boss walking into the, to the, to my office and saying, you know why I'm here, don't you? You're skiing too much. You're having too much fun away from the office, Mark, and you're not doing your job. And so I said, yeah, I, I, I felt like this was coming. So what I've done in my life, and, and, and it has to do with failure because I've had a lot of failures. I've had some success, yes, but I've had a lot of failures. I always turn, try to turn that around into something positive. And so I decided, all right, I don't know what I'm going to do, but one thing I do know, I'm going to go down and live in Chicago. I had been up there during one uh, summer uh, that I was at Purdue. And actually, that was a summer down there that I really enjoyed, summer in Chicago that I really enjoyed. Well, how can't you enjoy Chicago? So I decided to move down there. And here I got a job right away because I had experience as a bartender. And there was a bar on Rush Street called, um, oh, what was the name of it? Uh, I, I may think of it in a minute, but there was a bar there. And I went in and I asked for a job. And again, a little bit of serendipity because the bar was owned by two guys from Indianapolis. And I was a Hoosier. And so they hired me. And so I worked behind the bar. I went ahead and, and uh, uh, you know, poured the beer and did all of that. My main job, though, during the week was on a Tuesday afternoon, uh, two policemen would come in in their blue uniforms, and I was to give them a sack. And the sack was filled with money. And it was basically so that they would not come back to the bar and bust us for having underage drinker, drinkers or drunks or something like that. And so it was my first experience as, as bribing police officers, the men in blue. Well, while I was there, uh, you know, in that, uh, let's see, this would be in the fall of, um, of 68, uh, somewhere in there, um, several guys would come in and they would talk about, you know, uh, this is what I'm going to do now. You know, I'm thinking about going to law school. And, you know, I thought that sounds pretty good. And I noticed that uh, the, the girls in the bar, they liked to hear that. They thought that was neat that these guys were going to law school. And I thought, well, maybe this would help me in the, in the female department. Uh, but I was having a great time because my life was basically bartending from about eight o'clock until midnight, uh, going out and having fun most of the night, going to Oak Street Beach and, and getting into Lake Michigan and then repeating that. I mean, talk about a great life. Of course, my parents were thinking, what in the world are you doing? We paid for five, almost six years of Purdue. Now get yourself a real job. So I thought this, this, might, be this might be good for them. So I thought, but wait a minute, I got those terrible grades at Purdue. Well, again, being in the right place at the right time has defined a lot of what's happened in my life, as you will see. Because I called down to Indiana University at Indianapolis. Now, Indiana University Law School at Bloomington is the one that talks all about theory and, and has that degree. It's more prestigious. The one in Indianapolis was more of a practical curriculum. Basically, they would um, teach you how to practice law. 
and, and give you experience and so on, so forth with internships and things like that. So I called this guy, it was Dean Franson was his name, the Dean. And I said, look, this is not the, this is, this will be the second time I, I, I will do something once I said, you know, I'm thinking about, it. I'd like to come to law school, but my grades are awful. He said, well, why don't you take the LSAT, the law school examination test and see how you did. So you do. So I did. And I called him back and I said, well, I got a 515. He said, well, that's not really going to make much of a difference, Mark. That's not very good. But in the meantime, we have decided we've been a day, a night school. You know, we're going to have a day curriculum. And frankly, we need students. And so long story short, basically, I went down to Purdue or went down to Indi Indianapolis uh, one of my fraternity brothers was Billy Keller, who was a great basketball player at Purdue. Uh, almost won, they almost won the NCAA championship. He was playing for the Indiana Pacers basketball team. He, we got an apartment over near the fairgrounds in Indianapolis for $250 a month, if you can imagine that. And I started law school. They didn't have a building for it. So my first classes in law school were at a church, an old antique-like church. And there were probably 40 of us. I have those friends today that I went to law school with. Pat Riley is one of them. She's on the appellate court there in, in Indianapolis, the state appellate court. Uh, Mary Beth Ramey is a well-known lawyer there. Scott Montross, all these other people that have done very well in the legal profession were my classmates. And you know, I found that while I wasn't a great student in law school, I was a decent student because it was something I wanted to do and I, and all of that. And so I, I went ahead and, and studied during those years. But again, uh, serendipity uh, intervenes because uh, I had made a friend uh, of, of a lawyer named Larry Wallace uh, at a firm where I was interning. And basically I was a gopher. They sent me to file things and do other things, but I was learning about the practical way of of practicing law. Sometimes I'd go to court and watch them or whatever. But Larry was a public defender in the cr uh, criminal courts uh, downtown in Indianapolis, criminal court number uh, number four. And uh, he came to me one day and he said, you know, it seems to me like I've noticed you've, you've been in some of the courtrooms watching the, the, the trials and things. I'm a public defender, but I'm going to run for the legislature, Mark. And if I Am, am, am successful and become a legislator. I think I could get my public defender job for you from Judge Kohlmeyer in criminal court number four. And you're starting to see a pattern of these kinds of things happen, and it'll be even wilder as we go along as the things that happened to me. But he won. On a Friday, I was appointed a public defender. I just got to chill on this. A Friday as a public defender. On Monday morning, I tried a first degree murder case. Over the weekend, I went to see the man, I'll never forget his name, James Jethro. He was charged, he was about 30 years old, charged, and this is unfortunate, of course, charged with, terrible, uh, shooting his uh, near 300-pound girlfriend with a shotgun from six feet away in front of her children and killing her. Just a terrible crime. So I went to the, the jail and I walked in and I said, uh, James, um, I, I've been appointed to represent. Well, you're awful young. Have you tried a lot of cases and everything? I said, no, but I've watched a lot of cases. I don't think that impressed him. So we went to trial on Monday morning and obviously all of the evidence was against him. And I tried to do my best to, you know, he wanted to testify. And so he testified and said he was sorry that it happened. He didn't mean to and all of that. I watched the jurors. <laughs> They weren't really buying James's story very much. He'd had some trouble in the fast. And I'll never forget this. That, uh, I gave a final argument, doing my best as I could for him. And then uh, it was time for the, the jury to deliberate. And the judge said, well, Mr. Shaw, uh, and he said to the prosecutor too, where are you going to be uh, so that we can get in touch with you? And I said, well, my office is just a few blocks away. He said, well, why don't you stick around for a while? Well, that jury took 10 minutes, 10 minutes to convict James of first degree murder and put him in prison for the rest of his life. But you know what happened? Instead of yelling, screaming about maybe, you know, I was a terrible lawyer. Now he turned to me and he shook my hand and he said, thank you. I know that you did everything you could for me. And it, it, it taught me that uh, it, as long as I did everything I could for somebody, I wasn't always going to get them acquitted or a lesser sentence or what it might be. 
maybe this is something I could do because I enjoy talking to the jury. And I will tell you, I learned how to write books by talking to juries, just like I talk to readers with my books. So that's where it started. So it was interesting uh, because I, I still didn't know a lot about what was going on, but there was these three older uh, lawyers, and I call them the three wise men, Owen Mullen, P.K. Ward, and John Carson. That's a long time ago. I can still remember their names. And I got up in uh, municipal court. I was representing a prostitute at the time, and I had these all these law books, just like I'm stacking my, my books that I've written here uh, that we'll go over in a little while. I had them right in front of me, and I was quoting all this law and everything. <laughs> and this judge was listening, and I got done, and he said, are you done, Mr. Shaw? And he said, guilty as charged. And I was just despondent. I walked out in the hall, and these three men came up. One of them, P.K. Warden, said, well, you just learned a lesson, didn't you? Really, practicing law isn't much about the law, Mark. <laughs> well, that made me, you know, kind of think about what that was about. But I began a, a legal career. Uh, I, I was a public defender. I would be at the jail. Again, this is another lesson I think that students or others can learn. I would be at the jail at six o'clock in the morning, interviewing my clients that were appointed. I was appointed to represent. I would try cases in the daytime and I would investigate at night. And I did all of my own investigation, just like I've done in the books that I've written. I never uh, take other people's words for things. So I began to get a pretty good reputation for going into the courtroom and doing my best with these cases, where they were murder cases or whatever they were. And I gained that reputation and pretty soon I got referrals from people like um, bail bondsman or one bail, uh, bail uh, bondsman, this woman who uh, would send me cases. Police officers would send me cases because when they caught somebody, uh, the accused would say, well, I need a lawyer. Who should I get? And they'd say, Mark Shaw. Some of my best friends, frankly, we don't have this today, but some of my best friends were police officers. At one point, I had an office across from um, Marion County's uh, criminal courts building, uh, city county building there, and we used to have a dice game every Tuesday night. We would have a table, and we would throw dice against a law book, and we had perf we had uh, judges and prosecutors and police and defense lawyers. We had a great time together. A lot of plea bargaining went on. We weren't enemies. When we got into the courtroom, you know, we had our job to do, but we had respect for each other. And so I got these cases and um, I had a first uh, first degree murder cases, even of a, of, of a, of a guy who was charged with killing a, a white, a black guy charged with killing a white policeman. And I defended him. I had, um, you know, uh, all kinds of different cases. The only ones that I finally decided I just couldn't uh, handle in my mind were rape cases uh, and, and child molestations and all of that. I didn't feel right about doing that. But I liked the courtroom. I liked the drama. There is nothing more uh, exciting, really, or in, in, in can raise your blood pressure 20 notches than standing beside somebody who either is is it's possible they could lose their life or the second worst thing lose their freedom and so i took every case seriously and i got along with judges and all of that some of the cases bothered me but i did everything i could and i do remember at one point somebody coming to me and say well mark you have to know your client's guilty and i would say to them it was a young lawyer would ask me that i'd say you need to get out of the profession right now because that is not my job the only way somebody can be, uh, you know, uh, determined to be guilty is if a judge or a jury says so. What my job is to, is to give them every constitutional right uh, that they have. And so I did that. And then I got the biggest break of, of my career, one that would uh, amazingly uh, set up everything that happened in, in my life, just like my experience at Purdue did. Uh, one day uh, we were celebrating a case uh, in, in my uh, house and uh, that I'd won and people were having a good time drinking and all of that. Back then you could buy uh, Boone's Farm uh, strawberry wine for about 99 cents and that was one of my favorites. So I picked up the phone and uh, the man on the other end said, uh, Mr. Shaw, this is F. Lee Bailey. Well, at that time, F. Lee Bailey was the biggest name in, in the criminal defense world. I mean, he had represented Patty Hearst and, and he would go on to have all, uh, 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 he had represented the Boston Strangler and all of those. And, and he said, this is F. Lee Bailey. I said, oh yeah, right. Hey, thanks a lot. Come on over. And I hung up. 
And he called back, the phone rang in, and he came back on. He said, Mr. Shaw, this is F. Lee Bailey. And if you hang up again, it'll be the dumbest thing you've ever done. The reason he called is because there was a big case up in Anderson, Indiana. The defendant's name was Dr. John Lind, and he was a doctor up there. And the DA, DNA, uh, the uh, DEA, the, the drug people, believed he was dealing drugs out of his, um, his office. So they put an informant in there. Well, he was the DA agent, and what happened? About two weeks later, on a farm uh, near Anderson, uh, a cement block uh, bobbed up in the water with a body tied to it with no head. And uh, it was called the headless torso case. F. Lee Bailey hired me to be his co-counsel. And that really validated my being looked upon as a respected defense attorney. And that would follow me along as I continued on my, on my uh, wild adventures and journeys. But we tried a case. Uh, they couldn't prove exactly that the doctor was responsible for the DEA agent's death, but they proved that he actually blew up a hardware store in Anderson, Indiana, when the owner uh, charged him just a bit more for, X, for lead for his x-ray machine in his office. Dr. Lynn was convicted of that. Uh, Bailey and I did what we could, but that's what happened. And he ended up being put in federal prison. And when I stood with that man in front of Judge Holder in uh, federal court in Indianapolis, the judge looked at Lind and said, I know you killed the, the DEA agent, but I can't put you in prison for that. So I'm giving you the largest sentence I can. I think it was about 10 years. So F. Lee Bailey uh, validated what was going on in my life. But after that, I started to wonder what I was doing. Uh, there are no winners in the criminal justice system, obviously the victims. And I was as cognizant of what happened to the victim as I was to the person accused. And the accused life is over. Uh, whether they go to prison or not, it's very difficult. Will they ever be re rehabilitated? Probably not. And I got to thinking that maybe was this kind of the life that I wanted. I had very successful practice. I was making a lot of money. Uh, it was it was very, I, I really enjoyed it in the drama in the courtroom. But I got to wondering, maybe it was my conscience bothering me about what I was doing. I remember my father coming down and watching me in a trial defend, the, defend these two drug dealers. And he said, you better win or they're probably going to you know, blow up your home or something. So it, it just got to bothering me. And then there was the case that made the difference. It was a young, young man named Roger Washington, and he was charged with the brutal shooting of a social worker on the north side of Indianapolis. She opened the door. He was impersonating someone for a charity, and she happened to work for that charity and knew he was an imposter. And unfortunately, he shot her and killed her. In the trial that ensued, his grandmother um, uh, hired me to represent, him, represent Roger. Um, I did some things that I wasn't very proud of. I felt like that I was kind of crossing the line ethically. In fact, there was a young man, uh, Roger Washington was a tall, young black man, and uh, young, uh, probably 17, I think at the time, or 18. And, a, and another man who looked a lot like him walked in the courtroom and I said, well, wait a minute, uh, judge, we need to arrest that man. He looks just as much like the, the person who they say was at that woman's home and of course, the judge went crazy and the jury and everything else like that. Later on, by the way, uh, the foreman of the jury turned out to be that man who walked, that young man that walked in the courtroom's father. But when he got back to jury deliberations, he said, you know, Mr. Shaw was right with what he said. That man, that young man does look just as much as like Roger and they acquitted him. A reporter from the Indianapolis Star, Carol Pickering, who was very well uh, respected, came up to the, the council table where I was sitting alone, and I had tears in my eyes. And she said, well, you won another one, because I had won four, five, six in a row. And I said, I'm done. I quit. She, what? She said, you can't do that. I said, yes, I'm done. I, I'm kind of upset with the judicial system, but I can't do this anymore. And she said, well, Mark, if you, if you don't get in touch with me by Sunday, I think this was on a Friday, I'm going to write an article about this. And so I didn't get in touch with her. I went home and purposely didn't. And she wrote this article that, that I've sent along as part of our collection. And it, it shows a garbage can and F. Lee Bailey is flying off and I'm flying off to, 
because I had decided to go to Aspen, Colorado, where I had gone one summer and all of that. And it talked about the shock of the legal system that I was leaving. So now I'm sitting at home. I read this article. I think, what have I done? I can't practice law any place at Indianapolis. I have no idea what I'm going to do, but I knew it was the right thing to do. I got in my car and I moved to Aspen, Colorado and the beauty there. So as you can see, there were a number of things that happened at, at, when I was practicing law that, that in my own mind, uh, I, I just didn't feel right about them. And so I had to make a decision there. And, and again, I think, you know, I was taking a risk. And sometimes if you know things aren't in your, right in your life or whatever, maybe it's an occupation or whatever it may be, I, I think you have to be strong enough to have the courage to go ahead and decide that you're going to take a chance. And that's what I did. Uh, everybody thought I was crazy at the time, as they have many times since, but I knew it was the right thing to do. So from that point on, let me take just a drink here. From that point on, then, you're just going to be amazed, I think, as I am. Because F. Lee Bailey comes back into my life. I moved to Aspen, beautiful place. Uh, if, if people have been there, they know it's a small little um, village surrounded by the, the Rocky Mountains, the ski slopes. I mean, it's, it's Nirvana. If there's a heaven, I think it looks like Aspen. So I got there and I found a place to live and all of this. And I even ran across right away. Another thing happening. I ran across a lawyer in a bar and he said, I told him my story. He said, well, you might be a, you might, we might need a good researcher. You want to work for us. So right away I had a job working as a researcher until he found out the most of the time I was traveling 40 miles down the uh, uh, down the, down Valley to Glenwood Springs because we didn't have a law library in Aspen. And I was basically uh, researching a little and then going to the hot springs. I've always been quite a character and I suppose that will, you know, not impress a lot of people, but that hot springs was wonderful. So I came back and one day came in the office and he said, you aren't worth a damn at this research, but I hear you're having a good time at the uh, at the hot springs. I think we know, uh, you know, it's not going to work out. So he fired me, but we, we were still good friends. So the other thing that happened was that um, uh, it, you probably can't tell it exactly right now. But back then with my wire rim glasses and my hair was even longer, I had a very strong uh, similarity to John Denver. Now, John Denver was a country singer from Aspen, Rocky Mountain High John and all of that. And people would come up, especially women would come up and say, boy, John, we love your music. And I say, no, I'm, I'm Mark Shaw. Well, just in case you're John Denver, would you sign this, you know, whatever it was. So I would sign Mark Shaw. I'm sure they went back home and said, I got John Denver's autograph, but he signed it Mark Shaw. My friends would have John. They'd go up to him and say, what's up? What's up, Mark? Well, he didn't like that very well. And then I finally really met him on the side of Aspen Mountain with a friend of mine. And uh, he turned to me and he said, and I'll never forget, gosh, I feel like I'm looking in the mirror because we really did look a great deal alike. So the John Denver thing was, was something. I learned how to ski. I was a social skier in my jeans and everything and went up and down Aspen Mountain and all of that. But then there was a case that came up and her name, the woman's name was Claudine Langer. For a lot of people, uh, they won't know who that is, but that was this uh, French actress singer who was the wife of Andy Williams, you know, um, you know, the famous singer of, of many, many songs. And, and she had, she would lived in Aspen. She divorced Andy, but she was living with a famous skier named Sp Spider Savage. And Cy Spider Savage was um, really well loved in Aspen and all of that. But to uh, again, just condense this a bit. Uh, she had said, uh, it, it, actually, Spider Savage was shot by Claudine Langer in their, uh, in their Aspen home. And she said it was an accident, that uh, she didn't know how to use the safety on the gun and all of that. But there were a lot of people who knew of their relationship and that he was going to break up with her and all of that. He had, you know, had, um, he had two kids and other kinds of things that were going on and, and that wasn't working out. And so there was a motive there and motive would always come into everything I did in the future with the trials that I covered for the networks. Um, there was motive of her to have killed him. So uh, F. Lee Bailey was the legal correspondent for Good Morning America. And he had another case 
and he couldn't be the correspondent for the Claudine Langer trial. And his agent called me and, and GMA hired me as the correspondent. Talk about being at the right place at the right time. And if I hadn't taken the chance and given up the law practice and coming to Aspen, that would have never happened. I covered that trial for Good Morning America. I got the only interview that Claudine ever did after the trial. She was just convicted of um, reckless homicide and spent a, uh, 30 days in jail and all of that. But that was amazing because it introduced me to Good Morning America and they liked what I did. And so I became what you might call the uh, human interest story reporter. They would send me around the country. I, I really covered some significant important events like the national ugly dog contest, the uh, frog, uh, frog jumping contest. I covered the, this was kind of interesting, the Miss Nude California contest. Uh, I got to go to Lukenbach, Texas, Texas and interview w Willie Nelson, which was wonderful at the time. Uh, they had me do all these human interest stories. And the, the one that I'll mention uh, just briefly is the fact that at one point they asked me, you know, my, my training at Purdue and IU law school always comes into play. And, and so um, uh, they sent me to Philadelphia because there was the lawyer for a mafia guy who said he would talk to me about what they were thinking about the possibility of doing in Atlantic City. So I interviewed him. He told me more than we thought he should. That interview appeared on Good Morning or the next morning. They, the producers loved it so much, they said, stay in Philadelphia, see if he'll talk to you again. I called the law office and, and the secretary, I believe, or assistant answered. I said, is Mr. Such and Such there? Complete silence. I said, is Mr. Excuse me, I'm Mark Shaw, GMA. She said, oh, well, I'm sorry, Mr. Shaw, I guess you don't know. Uh, when, he, uh, when he started his car this morning, it blew up. They killed him. And this will come in later when I'm dealing with the JFK assassination about you don't mess around with those people in the underworld. So anyway, I did all that and I was happy. God, what a life living in Aspen, skiing, you know, being in the bars. Hunter Thompson, the crazy journalist uh, was somebody we tried to interview. He never showed up for the interview. All of these things were going on and it was a wonderful life. And then my life changed again because a, well, a very well-known producer named David Suskind uh, who produced a lot of shows that I can't remember the names of, somehow or another was watching one of my episodes on Good Morning America. And his, his uh, producer people called my agent and said, we'd like to talk to Mark. We're starting a program on CBS called People After the Magazine. And we need a co-host with Phyllis George, who was the former Miss America. So I flew to California and I met with Suskind and thought it would be a long interview. And he looked at me and he said, if you'll take off those glasses so you don't look like John Denver, you're hired. So I took off the glasses. I was hired. I tried context. They wouldn't work. And yes, with people, when I did the episodes, I kind of did them basically blind, but it was all right. And that was a wonderful experience because I got to ride around in a race car with Paul Newman at a racetrack uh, outside of uh, New York City. I got to interview Cindy Lauper. Uh, uh, girls just want to have fun in a, in a dumpster up at a hard rock cafe in Santa in San Francisco. I got to interview Dennis Wilson of the beach boys. Uh, unfortunately his drug had a habit. He died the next week, but that was a wonderful experience. The only problem was <laughs> CBS really didn't like the show very well. And they put it on Monday night against Monday night football. So I moved to New York city. I got a uh, apartment over on, on um, Beekman Place near the United Nations. I was making good money. Everything was, was great until I got the phone call canceled. <laughs> Once again, I was out of work. So I thought to myself, what am I going to do with myself? Sandy Hill, who was with the uh, co-host on Good Morning America with David Hartman, said, well, if you want to go to California, Mark, I'll let you stay in my home in P Pacific Palisades. I have no furniture but you're welcome to stay there. Well, I drove across country, I stayed there, and I started to do different kinds of things. But one of the things I thought is, I always had that law degree in my back pocket in Indiana if I want to do something else, I'm gonna take the bar exam. Well, as you can imagine, that's a stretch because again, I wasn't good at any of these kind of testing or anything. And so I went, I took the test, and then they put the, um, the um, 
results in a, in a legal newspaper. And when I got it, my name wasn't on there and I wasn't surprised. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll try to take it again or something like that. The next day I got a, a letter. And again, one of these crazy, hard to believe, difficult to believe situations. Uh, I got a letter from the state bar. Congratulations, Mr. Shaw. You are admitted to the bar of California. Now, again, you're starting to see the pattern here with things that happen to me that make no sense. And so, yes, I got my legal license in, in California. I started to go ahead and, um, and practice some law, a little bit of entertainment law, no, you know, no real um, uh, criminal defense law, but things like that. Well, that, that then let me be in, in LA and Hollywood land and all that. And so I, I started to land some television shows again. And the first one that came up, you know, was um, uh, a show that uh, was being done uh, by the Disney Channel. And you'll love this because it was called The Scheme of Things. It was all about uh, the, the truth behind, uh, you know, things like uh, UFOs or other kinds of things or whatever, but more about, you know, uh, the human body and how it was made up and everything. So they needed a personality they were calling Mr. Science. So the man who got the 152, or excuse me, got the five on the physics 152 test became Mr. Science on the Disney Channel. And we did almost 60 episodes of that, of that, um, of that show, uh, all kinds of different things. I went to Epcot and tried to explain the human brain and all these other kinds of things. It was just fascinating. And then there was a show called World of People that I lived on a houseboat in Sausalito, California, uh, across the uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And they sent me out to do different things. I did a legal show called On Trial. Um, all those kinds of things, you know, uh, really permitted me to go ahead and keep in the entertainment business. I did a show in L.A. and everything. So uh, the culmination of that was one of the great experiences of my life. Again, I love the creative process, whether it was how I would handle a criminal case or later on with my books and all of that. But at one point, I was kind of down and out. My, my career on television had gone nowhere. I hated practicing law in, in L.A. L.A. is, um, you know, it's completely different than the Midwestern values. You don't know who to trust there and all of that. And so I was really disconcerted. I was almost out of money. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I finally decided when I was young, we went to the Presbyterian church for a while. I never became very religious, but I just felt like that maybe I needed some spiritual leanings. And they had the most beautiful church in Beverly Hills, the Beverly Hills Presbyterian church. And so I went there for a while and I think it helped me kind of get my act together in terms of what was important to me. But one of the great parts of that was that almost every Sunday who would walk into the uh, into the church and go to the front row pew, but James Stewart, the one of the greatest legendary actors who ever lived. <clears throat> Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, it's a wonderful life, all of that. And I would watch him. And one Christmas, he read the story of Christmas. And it was like God was up there reading the story of Christmas in that voice of his and everything. And, you know, again, sometimes people ask me about the ideas for everything that have come to me with my books and everything. I think those ideas are out there and float around. So we have to be open to, to realizing that there's things that we may want to, you know, latch on to. Uh, most of the time that probably won't happen, but sometimes they're there. And so right away I got this idea. And I will tell you right now, my best ideas for anything I've ever done come in the middle of the night. There's some sort of a spirit that wakes me up with things, all the titles to my books, many of the ideas for my books. And one night I woke up there uh, where I was living close to the church and I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to know about where did that song come from? You know, this, this, you know uh, all of that, that, that James Stewart just read, the story of Christmas. So I got the idea for a program called uh, A Beverly Hills Christmas, uh, talking about the origins of that music. I went to the minister, James, pa uh, James Morrison, and I said, you don't think that Mr. Stewart would be interested in hosting a show like that, do you? He said, well, we could ask him. And so uh, most nervous I've ever been in my life, I sat in, in, in uh, the minister's office and I said, here's my idea, Mr. Stewart. And, and I, I'd like to see, you know, I was so interested in your going ahead and, and reading that story. Would you be interested in hosting the show and helping us 
put together a television show with some of your, you know, your actor friends and things like that. And he just turned around. And he said, well, of course. So I went to the same producer who had hired me at Good Morning America, Woody Fraser. And, and uh, that's incredible, those shows that he did. And I told Woody the idea and he said, sure. He said, I'll bet we can round up some of his friends. Will you talk about rounding up his friends? Lucille Ball, Burt Reynolds, um, uh, you know, all, uh, Walter Matthau, all of these people, singers, uh, um, one of the uh, country singer, there were uh, all these other people, famous people. I mean, who were, were they gonna say no to James Stewart? Of course not. <laughs> So we filmed Beverly Hills Christmas with James Stewart. People can still watch that on YouTube. And it was on the Fox network. And I was the producer of that program. And it was just wonderful, a wonderful experience. And I thought, just like that Washington case was supposed to be the last thing I did in, in, in the criminal you know, defense business, I'll bet this is supposed to be the culmination of my, my being in LA. And what did that do? That made me, I didn't even have a car at the time. I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, I was down and out. I didn't know what I was gonna do with my life. Uh, I, I, I was able to afford a train, uh, you know, train ride back to Indianapolis, back to Indianapolis, uh, back to Indiana, Indianapolis. Scott Montross, my classmate at IU, gave me a back office where I could start practicing a little law again. A wonderful friend of mine that was a secretary, Judy Deputy, found me a little home to live in that wasn't too expensive. Uh, I joined a health club where I could try to, you know, uh, take showers and things like that because the place that I had didn't have all that. I mean, it was really a time when I, I really had to uh, go back to Indiana with my tail between my legs because here was a guy who had risen all the way to hosting, co-hosting a primetime television show on CBS and now I was coming back there. But you know, nobody made fun of me. They were all happy to see me and I and, and, and encourage me in everything. Well, because I'd been out near the film business and everything, I decided, you know, maybe I could do something. And I learned about a guy who put a, a film fund together in Texas, Dallas, film Dallas. And I decided to put a film fund together in Indiana because I knew about that kind of business. I did so. Uh, we, uh, we went ahead and produced two films there, Diving In and Freeze Frame. Uh, and they're up on YouTube. We sold one of them to the Paramount uh, home, home Network. Uh, home uh, television network and all of that. And, and right at that time, then a, another defining moment, I was still a bachelor. This was uh, about 1988 or 89. So I'm 40 some, you know, years old, not getting any younger. And uh, as it would be, I was on a plane ride to Dallas and a woman said, you can't put your suitcase up there. And it was a woman named Chris that I had dated when I was a criminal defense lawyer. And uh, she said, we laughed about it. And I said, well, it's good to see you. And so she called me uh, after I got back and she said, you know, I'd like to get together. And I said, fine. I knew she was married. I said, fine. And so she sat down and she told me her story that she had married a man, a man in Indianapolis. Uh, she had four children. Uh, she had a daughter, 11 and triplet stepsons. And she said, we're going through a divorce. And she said, I don't know if you want anything to do with me. That's a lot of baggage, Mark, for a bachelor. And I said, no, you know, I, I just had a hunch again that this was another defining moment. Well, just to, to go forward with that, uh, basically, I married that woman uh, down at Disney World, uh, at Disney, Disneyland in, in Florida. We moved to a ranch down in southern Indiana. I started practic practicing little law and all of that. And then again, the most fortuitous thing came along that set up everything that would after that. Unfortunately, Mike Tyson had uh, gone ahead and got himself in trouble uh, for raping a uh, beauty contestant in Indianapolis. I knew the judge in that case because it was Pat Gifford who was a prosecutor when I was a defense lawyer. And I wrote her and I said, you know, I might be interested in just coming up and watching that trial. Can you get me a pass? She said, no, you, you come up here right now. I want to talk to you. So I did, and she said, Mark, I need somebody to handle the media for the Mike Tyson trial. Again, these are things that happen that I can't explain, I'm telling you. And I sat in her office and she said, I want, you've been in, you've been in Hollywood, you've been involved with the media, you've done all these different kinds of things, you can do this. And I said, well, sure, I'd be happy to. So I ended up handling the media and, and it was a tough job because 
the courtroom, they, you know, was small. They didn't they had so many people wanted to be in there, but I got to know all the people in the media. And what did it turn into by my doing that? I became the correspondent for ESPN covering the trial. I became the correspondent for USA Today, for CNN, for Channel 4 in London, covering that trial. And it was just amazing because I sat there in, this, in the front row, basically about 20 feet from Mike Tyson. He was sitting there, by the way, they put him in this, this suit that was about three sizes too small. So his, his muscles were bulging out of that suit. It looked like it was gonna blow up. I remember one time I opened the door into the um, offices uh, uh, next to the courtroom and he was standing there and he took up the whole space there. And I, I just said, oh, hello, Mr. Tyson, and quickly moved over. But anyway, I watched that trial and I watched his attorneys just completely blow. It. They had no idea what they were doing. His handler, uh, his manager, my, uh, Don King, had gotten him a lawyer in Washington, D.C. that was a tax lawyer who had helped King beat a tax charge. This was a rape case. And so what did they do? Well, they they just um, had no idea in terms of how to defend him. In the opening statement by uh, Tyson's lawyer, he said, Mike Tyson will tell you, which meant that Mike Tyson was going to have to testify. You never do that. You never want to, you know, promise that will happen. The cross-examination cross -exam uh, was awful of witnesses. Uh, at, at one point, when he gave his final argument, the argument was, Mike Tyson, get this, is, the, is one of the worst people who ever lived. He's violent, he's terrible, he's dangerous, and that woman should have known that he that, that never to go up to a hotel room with him, putting all the blame on her. Well, when I saw that happen, and when the jury was looking at, I knew he was convicted, and he was, and sent to prison, even though there was very little evidence against what happened. And the prosecutors hid the fact that she had gone ahead and made movie and TV deals and all of that. Well, I was outraged when that happened. And I went back to my uh, home and I told my wife, I said, I'm gonna write a book about this. That became Down for the Count. I hope you can see just the title. Down for the Count, The Shocking Truth Behind the Mike Tyson Rape Trail. Never written a book at all until I was 47 years old. But you know what? I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the organization that I had learned from some of the things that I, I did at Purdue. Uh, you know, uh, recently uh, I was told, and I think we have found it, and it will go into the archive, that I actually wrote uh, at one point for the Exponent. Uh, apparently they were sports uh, uh, stories. Uh, one of my fraternity brothers brothers was the, um, uh, was the uh, editor of that. And that may be the first thing that I ever wrote uh, in, in any form of a uh, long form with the, with the Exponent. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the organization and everything of the book. And, you know, it, it did pretty well, except for one uh, unfortunate, excuse me, one unfortunate uh, review. I'm sitting in my, uh, uh, my little cottage where I'm work, working down on the ranch, and we had six dogs, one for everybody, six dogs. One of them was named Reggie Miller after the great basketball player for the Pacers. And uh, I got the call from this uh, guy up in Indianapolis, my, well, my agent, and he said, uh, have you seen the uh, headline in the Indianapolis Star today? And I said, no. He said, well, you got to go back a few pages, but it's there. And the uh, headline, I hope you'll, you'll be all right with this, Shaw's book on Tyson Worthless. Shaw's book on Tyson Worthless. They gave five stars for good ones. I got none. And I just yelled and screamed, scared the devil out of the dogs and everything else like that. And I thought, man, that's, I never expected anything like this. On the back of the book, you see some nice, you know, endorsements and everything. <laughs> Sean's book on Tyson Worthless. But you know what I did? After I got over the um, wanting to kill, basically, that reviewer, I thought, you know, and I'm just going to use the word that I did. I'm going to write another damn book. And so that was the first book that I wrote, and it did pretty well. And then they just kept coming. The, the, the next one was a book called Bury Me in a Pot Bunker which has relations to Purdue. Bury Me in a Pot Bunker is uh, the autobiography of Pete Dye, one of the greatest golf course designers in history, who we can say right now. Uh, he and his, his wife, Alice, who I wrote a book, it was called Bury Me in a Pot Bunker that I wrote with him. And this is from Bertie's Debunkers about Alice Dye. They started the first tea program for young golfers up at Purdue. And then both the North and the South course were redesigned by Pete Dye. Well, of course that hadn't happened yet, 
but I knew Pete Dye from being a golfer on the Purdue golf team. That's another thing that opened up for me at Purdue. Uh, I was a good golfer in, in high school and I became a member of the Purdue golf team. And we actually won an NCAA championship while I was there. I remember one summer school and I had four or five of those. Um, I rode around on my motorcycle because I was so proud of my Purdue letter jacket. It, unfortunately, it's disappeared, but I did that because I was so proud of that. And it once another thing it did is we used to get to go to Florida. That opened up my world more just because I was at Purdue. And I got to go to the NCAA championships out at Palo Alto uh, in California at Stanford. So I knew the dies from a golf course in Indianapolis called Crooked Stick. And I got to know Pete and he had designed some of the greatest courses in the country and some out of the country. And I said, you need to write a book about this. And God bless him, he allowed me to do so. And then I wrote Alice's story. She was a great amateur golfer and helped him with a lot of his golf courses uh, after that. And so I started going ahead and, and writing my books. And then, you know, it, it was amazing because um, I really liked doing it. You know, I really had a good feeling about the fact that I could probably do this. So then the book started coming. And it's hard to believe, but after the Tyson book in 1992, and then 1994 with Bury Me in a Pot Bunker, I wrote a book about another Hoosier, with another Hoosier, Don Larson from Michigan City, Indiana, who to this day has pitched the only perfect game in the 1956 World Series. Again, I, I read a book uh, by Mickey Mantle that talked about the game, and I was amazed to find that Don had never read his story. And I think the only reason he chose me to help him because he'd had other people um, come to him and say they wanted to write the book is because I was a Hoosier and he knew he could trust me. And I met with him and I wrote this book and it became another book that was successful. Uh, you know, not, not, not bestsellers basically at that time, but, but, but doing very, very well. And then we go back to F. Lee Bailey again for the next book. And this will be in 1996. Bailey was representing at the time a man named R.A. Bob Hoover. Anybody who watches this video will know of R.A. Bob Hoover, World War II hero, one of the greatest uh, aviators of all time. He's one of the, he became known as one of the great aerobatic flyers. He's one of those guys that can take planes and go up and down and do everything else um, and, and then landed on a dime. And he was 80 years old and the FAA was trying to take his license away. So Bailey represented him and Bailey got in touch with me and said, you need to write a book about Bob Hoover. And I wrote it with Bob for Simon and Schuster. That was the first one that really happened. Doing that reminded me of a story I just wanna tell quickly at Good Morning America. Sometimes to get a job, you've gotta do something that you would never do probably. Not, not anything illegal or unethical, but something you would never do. Uh, the people at Good Morning America said, well, we've got a great, um, we've got a great story for you. We want you to go to Nellis Air Force Base out in California. And the, the, uh, the Air Force is playing these war games. And uh, we want you to go out there. And basically what they do is they take these jets and they play these war games in the sky. And we want you to go up in an Air Force jet uh, in the cockpit and let the, and we'll have a camera and let people know what those are all about. Number one, I'm afraid of heights. And number two, I'm claustrophobic to this day. But my agent said, Mark, if you want to stay with Good Morning America, you got to do this. So I went out to Nellis Air Force Base. I put on my little, uh, you know, my blue uh, Air Force uh, uniform. I got in the back of an F-4 fighter jet right behind the, 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 the pilot is here. I'm right behind him here. And there's this uh, partition, but it's got some openings in it. And uh, we go, we take off. And of course, my heart's beating a thousand miles an hour and I'm closing my eyes, hoping we get up there. And he says to me, now, listen, I can just really take you on a ride around and show you kind of everything. Uh, but but uh, if you really want to know what it's like, you know, Mark, I'd like to show you, you know, it's a little more exciting than that. Well, of course, I can't say I don't want that. So he just does all these loop de loops and everything. And what I did is I threw up. I threw up. And in the partition where there were the places open, it went all over him. So this was all on camera. And the next day, the, the, the GMA audience just went crazy, as well as the hosts and everything else. But I got that job, you know, longer with, with GMA because I did that. 
So I wrote the, the book about Bob Hoover, which reminded me of that. Then I went back to golf because a publisher finally got a hold of me and wanted me to write a biography of Jack Nicholas. There had never been one written about Jack Nicholas. He was supposedly writing his own, but Jack was very, very methodical. He was in his 25th year of writing it. So I wrote a book about Jack Nicholas. I uh, you know, followed him around on the PGA tour and the senior PGA tour and everything. And that book did pretty well. So again, you know, they just kind of kept coming along. So that was the Nicholas book. Uh, uh, let's see, Nicholas was just after, okay, now we went on to uh, Courage in the Face of Evil. Uh, this was a story about a Holocaust survivor uh, that was from Bloomington, Indiana. And right away when I, when I heard about this story and her wanting to write a book based on her journal, I wrote Testament to Courage, the concentration camp diary 1940 to 45 of a courageous German woman who risked her life to save others. And she was a, was a German Christian woman. She got in trouble with the Nazis for uh, sending flyers out and things like that. They sent her to Ravensbrück, the only woman's camp in Germany. And she became an angel of mercy. Uh, she saved a lot of lives there by what she could do. And then when a little girl was about to be exterminated, a little Russian girl, she helped hide her in a, a camp just outside the, the prison gates. And that little girl survived the war. So did Cecilia uh, Rexon, that was her name. And, um, and after the war, they met up. It's, it's a wonderful, inspiring story of, of somebody helping someone like that. So that was a book that I was really proud of. And later on, um, now just a, a couple years ago, I decided to update that book with some more information I knew about Cecilia. And this was a, a novel based on that book called Courage in the Face of Evil. So then I turned my back again to something that became an opportunity uh, that, that I could have never imagined, Larry Legend, Larry Bird from Indiana again. And Larry Bird was, uh, of course, the Celtics, Boston Celtics star, but he had decided to try coaching with the Indiana Pacers. And his first year of coaching was coming up. My agent called and said, Mark, you'll never believe it, but somehow or another, Larry Bird wants you to write his book with him. And I thought... I don't know how that happened, but I'd be happy to. And he said, well, the best thing about it is uh, there's a $400,000 advance for Larry writing the book, and you'll get 20% of it, which is around $80,000. I thought, this is too good to be true. Sure. What, where do I sign up? Where do I go? I got an NBA credential. And on the way up to drive for the first game that I was going to uh, cover, uh, meeting Larry, and going ahead and watching coach, my agent called me back and said, well, uh, Mark, Larry's decided he's not going to write the book. He wants $750,000 to do it and 400,000, it is enough and he won't budge. And so the book deals off. Well, you can imagine the disappointment there, but again, my feeling that you try to make something out of this. I had my NBA credential without Larry's permission I went ahead and watched him for that entire season. It was the Michael Jordan Bulls that they pay, played. I watched Larry as he was the coach. I interviewed Dennis Rodman. I interviewed all these people for that book and became Larry Legend. Uh, Larry was a little upset with me because in my books, I always put in their warts and all. Uh, I don't want people to believe that I'm going to uh, cover up anything that they should know. Well, Larry made a real mistake in his life when he was in college and thereafter. He impregnated a woman during college. And when they knew she was pregnant and was having the child, he failed to acknowledge that I was his child. And I thought that people should know that side of Larry, uh, that he basically just, you know, abandoned the child and the mother. So I put that in the back part of the book. Well, when he found out about that, I understood that he almost sued me because of what I put in the book. But I, I, I always have tried to be a person of the truth, and I felt that was important. The next book was Mis Miscarriage of Justice. In fact, it's amazing to think about it now, but I wrote 10 books in eight years and published them all, never self-published them. Publishers took them up. This was Miscarriage of Justice. I had a radio program in Bloomington, Indiana that we'll talk about in a little bit because it really did change my life. It was called Afternoons with Mark Shaw, three to six on a radio station in Bloomington. We covered local events and different kinds of things. And I had a guest on there named Dr. Morris Pollard, who was a, a professor at uh, Notre Dame. 
And um, his son, Jonathan Pollard, people may remember or not, uh, was arrested and charged with espionage as being a spy who passed on secrets to the Israelis. Uh, Jonathan Pollard well, it was, it was Jewish, and he felt like that the United States government was not sharing the proper information uh, with those uh, in Israel. So he, as he admitted, uh, gave the Israelis a lot of government secrets. Well, he admitted that, and uh, there was a plea bargain. And that plea bargain was to give him uh, a sentence commiserate with other spies uh, during the, the years who had been convicted or admitted uh, guilt and all of that. And that would have been around 30 years. Well, when they had the final hearing in front of the judge, the, uh, the secretary of, uh, of um, the attorney general, Casper Weinberger, argued for life imprisonment, double-crossed Jonathan, and that's what happened. So I wrote, excuse me, Miscarriage of Justice, the Jonathan Pollard story. And uh, this is one of the first books where I really was criticized, called a traitor. Uh, you're backing a, a spy. You're trying to defend a spy. You're doing all of that. And, and I had some real, uh, you know, nasty emails, phone calls, different kinds of things. But again, that's all, it's all part of what you do uh, when you're an author. Uh, you put the, the truth out there. I like to lay out the truth for, for like a prosecutor does, let their people make up their own mind about it. They're kind of stop and think books that way. That's what I do. So then before my life kind of fell apart, I wrote two other books. One was Let's the, Let the Good Times Roll. Nobody's ever written a, a, a book about the, mu the famous musicians from Indiana, Michael Jackson, John Mellencamp, uh, Michael Jackson, all of them. And I ran into a guy named Larry Goshen, who was the historian of all historians. And we wrote this book and published it. And it's, a, it's, it's become kind of a go-to book about all of the history of the of the, um, uh, of, of the you, you know, uh, Indiana musicians. So now we're up to about almost 2000 and then the roof fell in. Uh, while in, in uh, Nashville and I had that radio show, uh, the basketball coach for Indiana University was Bobby Knight. And uh, he was, uh, he, his antics and everything were very embarrassing to Indiana University. Uh, he had uh, at one point almost tried to strangle a player he was throwing things at secretaries. He was cussing. He was doing all these things, uh, basically because he was such an insecure person and his IU teams were not doing as well as they had done in the past. So I, I really uh, stepped out of line on my radio show. I bombed him every day. He needs to be fired. Uh, he's casting a dark shadow over IU, all of this, and uh, went probably too far with a personal attack on him. But I thought, OK, you know, uh, I, I, I probably ought to stop this. Well, something made me stop it. The three boys and I and I was so blessed with these four children as a stepfather. I had never been a father before. I'd always wanted to be one. We did everything together. We went to Disney World, Disneyland. We went to the Macy's Parade. We went to the Olympics. We did everything, especially the three boys and I and me. I, I coached them in, in basketball and in baseball. Um, I did everything I could with them. They were the love of my life, uh, uh, just the love of my life. I mean, they were just little bitty guys uh, when, when I met them. So uh, they were going to go to Purdue University. Their grades weren't very good either, even though, you know, it wasn't me that caused that problem with the gene, but their grades weren't very good. They, they were talk, talking about other places. And I said, well, frankly, uh, why don't you think about going to Purdue? It was such a wonderful experience to me. And so I actually, though, because their grades were bad, had to call the wife of one of my golf team guys, uh, Mike Gary, and his wife, I can't think of her name right now, but she was high in the administration. And she said, yeah, sure, Mark, based on you know, what you've done and all these other things, we'll get them in. So great, this is wonderful. Maybe even beta, theta, pi, you know, all this I'm thinking. One day they come home to the, the house and they've got IU hats on. I said, what's going on, guys? I said, well, all of our friends are going to IU. They're not going to Purdue. And I said, I've worked really hard to get you into Purdue. And that's probably one of the first real arguments we ever had. But finally, they decided that's what they were going to do. My wife and I took them over to IU. We got them into IU. We got them into a dorm and all of this. Two weeks after they were there, true story, they were in an assembly hall. Now, remember, there's 48,000 students, I believe, at the time at IU. They're walking out with their tickets to a football game. 
and in the door comes Bobby Knight. And I believe in my own mind today, although it wasn't clear back then, that he did this on purpose. He went over and grabbed the arm of Kent, one of the boys, pushed him up against a wall and berated him saying, don't you, uh, uh, Kent had said, uh, what's up night? Not meaning anything by it. He said, don't you ever call me night. You call me Mr. Knight or Coach Knight and did made marks on his arm and everything out of 48,000. Think, uh, I don't believe in the coincidences. Out of all those students, he grabbed my stepson. So Kent came, called me, and we went over there, and I said, what do you want to do about it? He said, at that time, Knight was under a zero, poli uh, zero tolerance policy. One more thing that he did, and he was out. So Kent said, I want to report it. I went to the administration and the police over there. Uh, they confronted Knight with it. He denied it, started calling me the evil stepfather, that I was lying and doing all this about them. We got on CNN. We yelled and screamed at each other, and we both lost. He got fired, and I ended up losing my family over it. The reason being that my, my wife at the time really felt like that I had not handled it well, that I should have backed down, that I should have not gotten in the war of words with him because I got death threats from his, uh, from his loyalists. They loved Bobby Knight. And so uh, it took about a year, but we knew that our, our lives were going to go the separate way. And it hurt. It hurt a lot because, unfortunately, uh, my relationship with the children changed as well. And so the only thing I could take away from that marriage was a small dog named Black Sox. And he and I moved to my uh, niece's uh, cottage on a, on a lake. And I finally decided if my time in Indiana was done. I had to get out of there and leave. And where did I go? I went back to Aspen. I really felt like that I'd gotten off of my, my spiritual balance, that I had um, I wasn't the same Mark Shaw anymore, that I had um, my ego was out of control. I was on ESPN all the time. I was doing these trials. I was, you know, I was working on um, different things. I had covered the, some of the OJ case. I, I had gone ahead and uh, and worked on the Kobe Bryant uh, trial uh, trial or case that he had and and been on ESPN and I just gotten too big for my britches, frankly, is an old Midwestern saying. So I'm in Aspen. I'm trying to figure out what to do, and finally I had this feeling. There was a book at the time called The Purpose Driven Life by Dr. Rick Warren, and it was about um, spiritual be spiritual things in your life. And so I went ahead and I started reading it and there were things in there that made a lot of sense. He came to Aspen to speak. I listened to him there and I got the idea I need to clean up my act. So I made another phone call like the one to Indiana University Law School. I called San Francisco Theological Seminary in, um, in Marin County across the bridge from the, uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge and said, do you let old people in with bad grades? This was 2006. I'm 61 years old. I believe if that adds up right. And the woman said, well, I don't know. We might. Well, they did. And I spent two and a half years there. And I was able to get my spiritual leanings back. I was able to go ahead and kind of clean up my act in terms of what I did. And when I was at seminary, I met Father Thomas Merton. And for those that don't know, he's one of the most famous, uh, you know, famous uh, spiritual gurus of all time. He was a, a Catholic uh, uh, monk uh, at Gethsemane down in uh, Kentucky, uh, all of that. And I started to learn about him in a spiritual, um, spiritual class that I took. And I found out that he had had a love affair of all things uh, close to the end of his life. And uh, he had fallen in love with a student nurse who was taking care of a bad back that he had. And they had a brief love affair. And I decided that this was something I wanted to write about because it was all he ever wanted in his life to happen. Uh, he wanted to fall in love. He wanted to be loved. So I wrote, beneath the mask of holiness, Thomas, Bur Thomas Merton and the forbidden love affair that set him free. And I chronicled it based on a journal that he had. Now, every other person, every other author out this, there, and this will come, up, come about when we talk in the JFK assassination books in a minute. This information was all out there, but nobody chose to write about it. I don't know if they were scared. Uh, well, it turns out there was a good reason why they were scared. Uh, they didn't want to show his human side. 
They only wanted to talk about the Catholic monk part. He had written a book called New Seeds of Contemplation, which has kind of become a Bible to me with great, uh, you know, sayings in there and all of that. But they didn't want to touch this. Well, when I got it published, uh, we went, to, I was called by my agent. He said, go to Amazon. And the first six or seven um, uh, reviews uh, were just awful, terrible. Uh, don't read this book. How dare uh, Mr. Shaw attack Thomas Merton and all of that. And by that time, um, I, had also, I had had a true blessing although come into my life. And that was that I went to a horse show in Aspen, Colorado. I'm sorry, not in Aspen, Colorado, in East Lansing, Michigan. I'd written all about humans, but I also wrote a book about horses called Clydesdales, the world's most magical horse. When my brother ended up leaving um, um, DirecTV, he decided to raise Clydesdale horses in Michigan. All right. And he did the Budweiser horses, all those kind of things. And so uh, I went back for a draft horse show because uh, we had talked about it. And he said and we decided that there hadn't been a book written about the Clydesdales. So I would write one. I went to Scotland. I looked at the Falls of Clyde and I wrote this book chronicling the history. So I was destined then in my mind, another one of these things that just happens to Mark Shaw to go back to East Lansing, Michigan, where there was a draft show a draft horse show, these huge horses. And while I was there, I signed books and things and then went down to watch the horses and standing there was this lovely woman, um, Asian woman standing there. And uh, I struck up a conversation with her. It happened that she had come from, she was a librarian at Michigan State University. And uh, I think she was happy because she didn't know too much about the horses. And here, was, here I was the expert. So we talked about that. There was a woman with red hair standing next to me whom she thought was my wife, turned out to be my sister. But anyway, I just had had the feeling and I get this feeling a lot uh, throughout, I've had this feeling throughout my life a lot that I was going to meet somebody new. And so I thought to myself, you know, I, I would love to get together with this woman, but she's married. And uh, fi finally figured out when I asked her, is your husband here? That unfortunately, her husband had died five or six years earlier. So she was free. And I used an, a kind of a trick. Uh, I said, you know, I would like to send you this book for your library, Wen Ying Lu, Lu, we call her. But I need to know how to get a hold of you. And so I got her card. Yeah, use that. And pretty smart. And so when I got back to California, where I was living uh, in, in uh, Marin County, I asked her to come out and visit. Uh, again, a little bit of a long story short, she came out and the two of, I, two, two of us connected. We were married in 2006 because I had cleaned up my act by going to seminary and deserved a woman could, and could deserve a woman like her. And so then true love happened because I gave up the warmth of California and the beauty of California for the cold and the mosquitoes of East Lansing, Michigan. But I didn't care. I love this woman. I moved back there. We published the Merton book. Um, and then after a while, I said, you know, would you think about moving west? And there was a job at the University of Colorado. And we moved out to near Boulder. And at the time, I'd heard about a story, another story. And this was a story involved with a woman named Ursula Martins who was a German, a German young woman who was part of the Hitler youth. And she had bought into everything that Hitler uh, told the young people. Uh, she thought he was God and all of that. And finally, uh, you know, near the end of the war, Second World War, she figured out that he was, you know, nothing that he said was true and, and that he was a, a demagogue and, and that all these people had been killed and everything like this. So she ended up leaving Germany, coming to Los Angeles and finding her spiritual self and ended up uh, writing, you know, having this story that I learned about having all, come all the way from being a Hitler youth to someone who had a spiritual transformation, as I said, the spiritual transformation of a former Hitler youth leader. And I wrote Stations Along the Way, which had to do with her, her, um, her father being a, a railroad uh, uh, ran the railroad uh, stations there. So we're done with that. And then um, uh, just quickly, I uh, one day, you know, uh, it's beautiful in Colorado there. We went up to Aspen and Vail, some and great friends, lo who loved her job. And then, uh, but it's cold. And again, uh, getting up in age, I, I thought, you know, uh, maybe uh, we need to move west again. 
And the convincing part was going to a FedEx office, uh, office one day and mailing something and coming out of there and stepping on uh, ice and doing a complete somersault and hitting my head, almost knocking myself out. And I came back to the hall, uh, to our uh, condominium. I said, Lou, what about moving to California? <laughs> I think I've had enough of this. So God love her. She said, okay. And she found a job at the San Mateo uh, County Libraries. She had always wanted to be involved with county libraries and things like that. And she found a job there as a cataloger. She's always been a cataloger. I should, I'm going to give her a plug here. She, she also got her PhD, University of Illinois and Michigan State and all that. So she's a smart one in the family and, and all of that. So she got a job with the San Mateo County Libraries. And at that time, then, I was looking for another book. And in uh, 1996, I had found out that one of the most well-known uh, lawyers in the world at the time, Melvin Bella from San Francisco, had died in, in 96. Well, I knew him because while I was uh, in, in uh, San Francisco um, and, and in uh, seminary, uh, and during earlier times than, than that, I had practiced law in San Francisco for a little while in his building, downtown San Francisco. Melvin Belli was a bigger than life lawyer. He was a personal injury lawyer. He's one of the first to have gotten million dollar verdicts by suing pharmaceutical companies and everything. He represented Muhammad Ali, uh, the Rolling Stones, um, Errol Flynn, and all of those people. And Mr. Belli had written two autobiographies. Now get that, two autobiographies, and they conflicted. This was about his life. So I decided I'm going to look into writing a book about Melvin Belli. I've inter interviewed all of his colleagues, some of them that I knew. I interviewed his sixth wife, okay? Interviewed everybody. And that would become the book, Be Melvin, Melvin Belli, King of the Courtroom, published in 2007, okay? 2007. While writing that book, two things happened. I'll mention one right now and one in a few minutes. The first one that was Melvin Belli was Jack Ruby's lawyer, the man who shot Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, I, I first of all wondered, wait a second, uh, why does a personal injury lawyer who's never really tried any criminal cases, let alone a capital case, because um, the, the death penalty was possible for Ruby, how did he become Jack Ruby's lawyer? And then I thought also, I found out that he had never let Ruby take the witness stand, which Ruby wanted to do. And he had come up with this psychomotor epilepsy insanity defense. That Ruby was basically crazy when he shot Oswald, which the jury didn't buy and convicted Ruby. And then the answer came along. Ruby's main, main client at the time was a guy named Mickey Cohen, who was a well-known Los Angeles gangster member of the underworld, connected throughout the United States with all of the big mafia dons, Frank Costello in New York, Sam Giancana in Chicago, Carlos Marcello in New Orleans, which will come up, uh, Santo Traficante in Miami, all of these uh, connections. And I came to realize that Belli had been brought into the Jack Ruby case to, si to silence him. They had silenced Lee Harvey Oswald because I was going to be, I was, I was um, suspicious that the mafia had something to do with JFK's death, which I will have proved in a, in a later book. And so I started looking into Belli and his connections to the Ruby case and all that other kind of stuff. And it took me back to the 1960 election. And just to summarize that, people will remember that running for president was Richard Nixon and, and John F. Kennedy. And it was a very close election coming up. And Joe Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy family, who wanted to be president himself, but had botched that by uh, be, being too nice to uh, Adolf Hitler when he was ambassador to Great Britain, decided if I can't be president, I'll, I want my sons to be president. So JFK was chosen. And uh, that election was going to be close. And Joe Kennedy knew that if they didn't win Illinois and West Virginia, they'd lose the election. Joe Kennedy had had uh, connections to the mafia in the past as a bootlegger, so he got a hold of his friend Frank Sinatra, who also had connections to the mafia, and Sinatra became the go-between between Joe Kennedy and some of the underworld characters with this idea. You help us win the White House, and if you do, 
when we get in the White House, we will leave you guys alone. A de a, a, a deal with the devil in some ways. So JFK becomes president. They help him win both those states through Mayor Daley in Chicago and all of that. And what's the first thing that I found out happened? I found an eyewitness who was right there when Joe Kennedy ordered John Kennedy to appoint Bobby Kennedy attorney general. And that would cause, in, 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 in dealing with my next few books, three deaths. What really happened there is that predictably, Bobby Kennedy, who hated the mafia from the McClellan hearings and earlier, went after those guys, especially one of the mafiosos in New Orleans named Carlos Marcello. And Marcello hated Bobby Kennedy because what Kennedy did was deport him illegally to Guatemala. And then when he got back in the country, he charged him with racketeering. So as the end of 1963 comes along, uh, Marcello decides, I can't let this happen. I've got to do something about Bobby Kennedy. I want to kill the SOB, but if I do, Jack Kennedy will come after us with everything the government has. But if I kill John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy will be powerless. And that's exactly what happened. Bobby Kennedy never went after those uh, people again. So I wrote this book called The Poison Patriarch how the betrayals of Joseph P. Kennedy caused the assassination of JFK. And I will say also as kind of um, uh, a tip to people who are going to look into perhaps right, even writing books or, or creative things or whatever it may be with regard to a job or whatever, you've got to be creative with regard to that. You've got to think outside the box at times. You can't just, uh, you know, I try to use logic and, and motive in my book my books, but you need to be aware that there are things that are going to come along that not, may, not, may not make sense at the time, but they'll connect to something. So it's called How the Betrayals of Joseph P. Kennedy Caused the Assassination of JFK, meaning that if, JF, if, if Bobby hadn't become attorney general and went after Marcello, uh, then uh, JFK would not have been assassinated. Well, the other thing that I remembered and, and by the way, I, I told people in this book, you need to start looking at the JFK assassination differently than anybody ever has. Why Bobby Kennedy wasn't killed instead of why JFK was. That changes everything. Why Bobby Kennedy wasn't killed instead of why JFK was. So is that enough? Should I stop? Well, during the Melvin Belli research, one day, one of his uh, friends, a doctor in San Diego said, you know, uh, Melvin Belli knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And I said, well, what, what? Northy Kilgallen, I know who that is. She was on the, the famous television show, What's My Line? It was on CBS and all of that. And he said, well, yeah, she was, Mark, but you don't know anything about her. Dorothy Kilgallen was a remarkable, remarkable woman. A college dropout, she rose to what the New York Post called the most powerful female voice in America. She had a column with the, uh, you know, New York Journal of American syndicated to 200 newspapers across the country. Yes, she was the star of What's My Line, watched by 10 million people every Sunday night. But also she, she um, had a radio program listened to by a million people in New York City she co-hosted. And she covered the Dr. Sam Shepard case, which became the fugitive movie, the Lindbergh baby kidnapping case, and Mark, she covered the Jack Ruby trial. And more than that, as my research would show, Dorothy Kilgallen was at the Jack Ruby trial in 1964. And she started right away writing these columns, the Oswald file must not close. She didn't believe in the Oswald alone theory at all. She was the only one who wrote that way. Uh, at one point she said, um, you know, we need to look at, at other situations here that could have been responsible for uh, JFK's death because it was not Oswald alone. And so she was going the wrong way against J. Edgar Hoover shouting, Oswald alone, Oswald alone, Oswald alone. And so what I learned is that uh, she had decided to investigate JFK's death because they were good friends. He had been to her home in New York City, uh, playing at parties and things like that. And he had taken, she had taken her son, Kerry, to the White House. And while there, JFK made a big fuss over that little boy. And, and in the book that I finally wrote called The Reporter Who Knew Too Much, uh, The Mysterious Death of What's My Line TV star and media icon Dorothy Kilgallen, this book here, which became a bestseller, I was able to show that while they were at the White House, she wrote in, in, in her column, 
What I remember is a tall man stooping over a little boy, applauding him for the letters he brought, he brought from her third grade, from his third grade class. And if Dorothy Kilgallen went over after a story, she went after it full bore. Uh, how many people around the country and around the world, I've gotten probably at least five, 6,000 emails. There are more than 3 million views on YouTube of my presentations and interviews. I hear from people and one thing in common is, we wish we had a reporter like Dorothy Kilgallen's that has that kind of integrity today. So I looked into her life and times and I looked into her JFK assassination and basically what she came up with was that Carlos Marcello had orchestrated the JFK assassination and uh, was it was going to uh, was going to uh, expose that and the fact that J. Edgar Hoover had covered it up in a book she was writing for Random House. So as we get to the fall of 1965, Dorothy is doing that. The first place she went after she interviewed Jack Ruby at his trial and whatever he told her, she didn't go to Dallas and look at LBJ. She didn't go to Washington and look at the military complex. She didn't go to Miami with regard to the uh, Cuban, um, you, know, uh, you know, the Cuban exile. She didn't go to Russia. She went to New Orleans. And she was able while she was there to get new information connecting uh, Jack Ruby, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald and Carlos Marcello. And she went back to New York and there's, I want to tell people for sure, this, this particular website is dedicated to Dorothy, the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org, the Dorothy Kilgallen story.org. And it's everything about Dorothy. It's all of her photos, it's videotaped interviews, it's um, uh, quotes from her, it's all of her columns. It's everything about this remarkable career that she had. And, and one of the first things you see when you get in there is a photograph of her at the Dr. Sam Shepard case in a courtroom. And around her, just compacted with her, almost squeezing her in, are all the other reporters in admiration. That's the woman that Dorothy Kilgallen was. And so I was very disturbed when I found out that after she got back to New York, she told one of her hairdressers, and that videotaped interview is on that website I just told you, if the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination, it would cost me my life. If the wrong people knew what I know about the JFK assassination would cost me my life. And I want to go back just quickly to one thing before we get into what happened to Dorothy. Dorothy in 1936, when she was 23 years old, there was what they called the race around the world. And this is 23 year old Dorothy. Uh, and she decides to enter that race for the New York Journal American uh, against uh, two male reporters. She's the female one from the New York Times, one from a new, another newspaper. Now this won't sound like a big deal now, but they had to use commercial aircraft. So that was the small planes they had with not very many passengers, ships, rail, all that kind of thing, okay? That's what they had to do and go around the world. So she entered this race and she went around the world. And, and uh, after she, uh, what, before she did, by the way, and here's certainly a connection that we both know about with regard to Purdue University, she got a telegram from Amelia Earhart. And that telegram is in my latest book, Collateral Damage, that we'll talk about. And it wishes her well, get enough sleep. Now, this is Amelia Earhart, the most famous, arguably, famous female aviator of all time. And we both know also now that she spent time at Purdue. And we have a photograph that I was kind enough to give us from the archives of her standing in front of the airplane that Purdue University's foundation um, financed that she took around the, you know, in her fly, try to uh, try to fly around the world. And she's with all of her students who she was educating about flying. So we have that connection. And, and when Purdue got in touch with me here, I was just flabbergasted because there was another connection. The other one is Neil Armstrong, who has a collection at your university, because I was able to interview um, Neil Armstrong, when I was living in Southern Indiana, I was told he was going to write a book and wanted to maybe write it with me. I had lunch with him. And unfortunately, he decided not to write the book. But I will never forget what a gentleman he was. And and all of that. So it was another collection with Purdue. I mean, I'm just aghast. And so is everybody else that knows about this, that my collection will be upside alongside the collections of those two um, uh, remarkable people. So now we go back to Dorothy as we get to the end of 1963. On November 8th, 1965, she is found dead in her apartment, in her um, townhouse 
in a bed she never slept in, wearing clothes she never slept, uh, wore to bed. She's got her eyelashes, her makeup, and a hairpiece on. There's a book on her lap upside down she never read. Her reading glasses are not around. And, uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no investigation of that death, despite that in, in anybody's mind looking like a, a staged death scene. The police come. Uh, detectives sees an empty bottle of second all sleeping pills beside the bed, decides that she's another one of those celebrities who's overdosed. Um, they, they conduct an autopsy that supposedly said that there was just one barbiturate in her system. Um, the, uh, the conclusion is, uh, and this just drives me crazy and is a similarity with Marilyn Monroe's death, we'll talk about um, um, an overdose of barbiturates, circumstances undetermined which means basically that they don't know what happened, but they give the media the first part of it and not the second part, and, and Dorothy's reputation is ruined forever. She's looked at like a, like a drug addict. There's no investigation. They never interview anybody, and Dorothy Kilgallen basically disappears from the face of the earth until I was able, with her guidance, I will tell you, from above, and some people think I'm crazy, but I believe that Dorothy, for whatever reason, chose me to write the book about her. And with the evidence I was able to find in that book and the next two, including the new one, she kind of, I felt like that she kind of guided me along with regard to what I was, what I was doing. Uh, as I say, some people may uh, have problems with that, but I think you need to be open to those kinds of things happening. So the book that she wrote about it is called Girl Around the World. And uh, it's, it's a very, very rare book. I was able to purchase one last year. There are none others out there except in some museums. There's one, a couple at UCLA. I've tried to get them to give me a second copy. And uh, as you can imagine, fallen on deaf ears. But this will be the crown jewel, I think, of the collection that we have at Purdue available for people to look at and all of that. And it's amazing in there because I, I just want to read, I don't, I don't want us to run out of time, but I just want to read one thing that, that Dorothy wrote in here. She wrote, I'm a reporter who likes danger and excitement, but I must always be truthful and say I would say it just like it should be said as well as I can every single day. That's, that's, the, that's the credibility of Dorothy Kilgallen. And as she leads me through the JFK assassination with not only that book, but the next one that I published, Denial of Justice, Dorothy Kilgallen, Abuse of Power and the Most Compelling JFK Assassination in History. That was my, my guideline because I had, and again, I'm not, I'm not completely unsure that Dorothy didn't lead me to them, but this is Denial of Justice. And I had two things with it and I'll mention those. I was able to find a copy of the Jack Ruby trial transcripts and I felt like a fool when I was told about them. 2000 pages of the Jack Ruby trial transcripts that had been hidden from view since 1964. A lawyer down in Fresno, California called me one day and said, I just read the, re I bought the reporter who knew too much at five o'clock and I read it by 11 o'clock and I have a gift for you. And I said, what's that? I have a copy of the Jack Ruby trial transcripts. And I thought to Mike, my God, Mark, why didn't you ever think of that? These are the most credible, the most credible evidence about the JFK assassination in history. You've got eyewitnesses to history who are testifying about this. I should have found out about this and read it a long time ago. So he sends me the 2000 pages. I read every single one of them. And I realized right then this whole Oswald alone theory was absolutely bunk. It goes on to this dis today, this distortion of history. The Sixth Floor Museum at Daily Pla Plaza, for instance, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Dallas, uh, continues to perpetuate the Oswald alone theory. The, the uh, museum is a shrine to Lee Harvey Oswald. No other books are allowed that are con contrary to that. Nothing about the uh, Ruby trial transcripts. They don't let any speakers come there with regard to it. And all of these students and teachers come through there and, and see a side of history that is incomplete, even though they, uh, they say they're the most de definitive uh, place to find um, the truth about the assassination. And I've made that aware to the Texas 
Texas Commissioner of Education. I've yelled and screamed on all of the interviews I've done that that place needs to be either burned down or required to give all of the information about the JFK assassination. And we will be able to do that, by the way, in our collection, because I include all aspects of everything in my books. So the denial of justice had in there in the Ruby trial transcripts the day that Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald. There was overheard a conversation uh, from Ruby to somebody on the other of the phone. I will be there when the transfer takes place. Remember, Ruby always said he just happened to be there and all of that. The police will help me get in. My police friends will help me get in the basement. And Dorothy Kilgallen had written a friend about how a, a column about how many uh, friends uh, Ruby had in the police department. They used to come to his nightclub, his carousel club. And the third one was, I will make like a reporter so nobody knows that I'm really trying to get in to do anything to, to Ruby, to Oswald. Well, that burst open the dam in terms of the truth about the JFK assassination. Now, does everybody believe what I came up with, my conclusions in denial of justice? Of course not. But at least I've made the world know about that through my presentations, investigations in that book. So I was done. I was done. I was done with books. Enough, Mark. But along with all of the readers of my books around the world and their, their emails and, and comments about my things, say one question. Is there a connection, Mark, between the deaths, a life and times and deaths of Marilyn Monroe, uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, and John F. Kennedy? And I didn't think so. And I didn't think I even wanted to look into it. But I finally decided I was going to. And so what did I first find? Now, remember, Marilyn Monroe is supposed to have committed suicide. That was the official verdict. Dorothy Kilgallen is supposed to overdose on drugs. JFK is supposed to have been killed by one man. So there's three true crime murder mysteries. I'd never written about three people. It's bad enough to write about one person, tough enough to write about one person. But now I'm looking into this. And the first thing I see is a photograph, which I have up on my wall here. Um, of Dorothy Kilgallen and Marilyn Monroe together on the movie set uh, at, at 20th Century Fox. And below it, by the way, I will tell you that I have uh, the guideline to everything I've done with regard to representing victims, uh, those who have passed from the face of the earth. It's a quote by Lois McMaster Bougeau. The dead cannot cry out for justice. It is the duty of the living to do so for them. I represent these people. I am their voices. I am going to try to get justice for them. So my duty is to find injustices and try to rectify them. But Marilyn Monroe committed suicide, but she knew Dorothy Kilgallen. And then in every book I've written, there is one time when I find something that triggers the book. Otherwise, there would have been no book. I find a column that Dorothy Kilgallen wrote two days before Marilyn Monroe died. And to summarize what it said, it said, uh, Marilyn Monroe is on the upswing. She's going to Hollywood parties. And more than that, she's found uh, a name bigger than, uh, she's found a bigger name than that of Joe DiMaggio, the famous baseball player that she was married to her second marriage, her divorce with them. She's found a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio in the romance department and is doing very well. I thought to myself, is this a woman who commits suicide two days later? That doesn't make sense. And so then I found another column she'd written about Marilyn and Marilyn's craving for love and all of that. And I went ahead then and I did what I, I both did in, in both of the other cases with JFK and Dorothy. I looked at the autopsies. And there were two, one autopsy and one certificate of death. The day after Marilyn died, the verdict in the morning was overdose of drugs. By three or four o'clock in the afternoon, the verdict was committed suicide. And that's what appeared on every newspaper in the entire world. And that's where her reputation was ruined forever. So I thought, well, I'm going to look into this. So I went ahead and I started thinking about, I went back. There's, there's clues that you find. I did that with my criminal defense cases. And, and it's cases, it does that with my books as well. There's a clue that you find that says to, your, to, to you, wait a minute. In that column that Dorothy wrote, bless her, she said a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio. Well, who's a bigger name than Joe DiMaggio? John F. Kennedy. That's bigger. President of the United States. 
So I've, I went in and looked into that because I think most people know, if they don't find, but that, Dorothy, that Marilyn Monroe had a brief affair with John F. Kennedy. She was sent back to, uh, she went back to New York City and she sang happy birthday to him on his 45th birthday, one, um, one day before. By the way, I don't want to forget to say these three people died within 40 months of each other, each at a very young age, Marilyn 36, JFK 46, Dorothy 52. She went back to New York. She sang happy birthday to him. There's only one photograph of Marilyn with both Kennedys, Bobby and Jack Kennedy, and their, their backs are kind of the camera. I don't know if they wanted their faces seen, but it's after that concert. And, and she then had a, a brief love affair with John F. Kennedy, but it was brief. So she's dying in 62. You know, that's happening earlier. But now, wait a minute, Mark, who's the next bigger name? Bobby Kennedy. And that opened the old Pandora's box. Because I was able to prove in collateral damage the mysterious death of Marilyn Monroe and Dorothy Kilgallen and the ties that bind them to Robert Kennedy and the JFK assassination that Robert F. Kennedy was responsible for, Dor for Marilyn Monroe's death. Now, I've gotten a lot of blowback on that, both from people who remember the Kennedys and love them and the Camelot days and all of that. But the Kennedys, the Kennedy boys were philanderers. They made mistakes in their lives as well. But basically, through the evidence that I have in collateral damage, I've been able to show Bobby Kennedy. Well, how did I do that? First, I had to show that there, uh, what I wanted to show that there was some motive if he was responsible for Marilyn's death. Well, what I found first was a letter from Jean Kennedy Smith, the sister of both Kennedys, who had written a letter to Marilyn just in the summer of 1962. We understand that you and Bobby are the new item exclamation mark. When he, we believe that when he comes back to New York City, you should come with him. The connection between the two. And then I found a CIA document that was um, uh, distributed just three or four days before Marilyn died. Bobby Kennedy has had a torrid love affair with Marilyn Monroe during the summer of 1962. In fact, he has told Marilyn Monroe that he will divorce Ethel Kennedy and marry her. There was my connection between the two of them. So I still don't have a motive in terms of what happened. I found out then that Bobby Kennedy was in Los Angeles in the summer of 62. He had written a book called The Enemy Within, which blasted the underworld, made fun of them, their oily skin, their I mean, oily hair, their, their shark skin suits, all of this. One of the things that caused the assassination of JFK because of his hatred for them. And he was at 20th Century Fox trying to get a, a, a movie made. Okay, now he's in LA. I found through my research, and I only use primary research, I only use books that were written very close to the event and all of that. I found an account where uh, there was a ledger at Beverly Hills Hotel. Bobby Kennedy was there on June 26th, 1962. Okay, and we're gonna go to August, 4th, 1962, when she died. So he was there in the summer. And so I knew he was there. Well, would he have been directly involved in Marilyn's death? I don't know if he would have, but let's see where he was close to her death. Well, he had an airtight alibi. He's in San Francisco at a bar association meeting, and then he's with friends uh, south of San Francisco. Well, that's going to cause me all kinds of problems that he wasn't there. He wouldn't have had to have done away with Marilyn for the motive that I'll give up, uh, uh, talk about in a minute. He could have had somebody else do it from there, but I want to show he's in LA. And then I find two jewels. One, a ledger at 20th Century Fox talks about a helicopter landing on the day of August 4th, 1962. And the man who's in charge there swears uh, in that ledger that he saw a helicopter land. Out of it came Peter Lawford, who was the brother-in-law of the Kennedys, and Robert Kennedy, and that they took off in a limousine. Then I found the, find the account in a book written very close to then, and people just ignored all of this, unfortunately. I mean, I'm not the greatest researcher in the world, but it was right out there. This guy, Lynn Sherman, a Beverly Hills police officer, stopped a limousine at midnight on August 4th, 1962, on Wilshire Boulevard, going 75 and a 30. When he got to the door, it, he, he saw Peter Lawford driving, and he said, hello, Pete, because he knew him, and he saw Bobby Kennedy in the back seat. So now I know they're there. All right, now, motive. 
What would have been the motive for Bobby Kennedy to have eliminate, eliminated Marilyn Monroe after they had this love affair? Well, I went back to the same CIA document and I found that in that document, they talked about, first of all, connecting JFK, Marilyn and Dorothy Kilgallen through of all things, obsessions with UF, uh, UFOs. And that in there, it talks about through a wiretapping of a conversation with of Dorothy's that JFK was going to order uh, an investigation of Area 51 and all these UFOs and all that other kind of thing, and that he had told Marilyn about that. And then in there, it says also that there was an event that took place apparently up at Lake Tahoe at a hotel where Marilyn got all upset with everyone, Lawford, Peter, uh, Peter Lawford, Sinatra, a couple mobsters. There's a question as to whether Bobby Kennedy was there, feeling like she was going to be passed around and she said there the same thing that Dorothy Calgallon said back in, in, in later in 65, I'm going to crack the JFK assassination open. Marilyn said, I'm going to the media with this. And when she got back to L.A., apparently, uh, according to the CIA document, she was going to expose JFK with being interested in UFOs, which would not have been popular. She was going to talk about the love affairs with both Kennedys, which would have been bad enough but also either through pillow talk with one or both of the Kennedys, they had told her that JFK was pl helping plan the assassination of Fidel Castro. Well, if you can imagine if, J if, Dorothy, if Marilyn Monroe would have gone to the media with that, it would have destroyed the Kennedys. Bob, uh, the JFK would probably have been uh, forced to resign. Bobby Kennedy would have never been uh, attorney general again. And so they couldn't let her do that. And what happened then is obviously there's a motive to have eliminated her and silenced her. And what I've been able to, to, to show is that on that day that Bobby Kennedy was there, he and Peter Lawford went to her home. They pleaded with her not to go to the media. She refused. And that night, and now I have not one, but two, but three accounts that later on op op operatives of Bobby Kennedy's went to that home. I'm not going to go into exactly how uh, Marilyn Monroe was poisoned with the barbiturates that killed her, but that's in collateral damage as to how it happened. I think it's a very plausible way that it happened and that Marilyn Monroe was silenced because in some ways she was the actress who knew too much. And the other thing that I've concluded with regard to that is this, and some have agreed, some have not, but so far I haven't had one single person that I feel like is really credible argue with this conclusion. And it takes a minute, you gotta go slow with it because I think it's historically important. And the success of the book and the, and the, um, the, the number of views, the millions of views and everything else, uh, people have written me and believe that this does make a lot of sense because frankly, it's logical. If Bobby Kennedy would have been prosecuted for the death of Marilyn Monroe in 1962, based on compelling evidence at the time, there would have been no JFK assassination because those responsible, Carlos Marcello, would not have had to kill JFK to make him powerless because he would have already been powerless, resigning as attorney general. And further, Dorothy Kilgallen would not have been killed in 1965 because there would have been no JFK assassination for her to have investigated. So the collateral damage of, of all of this is the deaths of these three remarkable people. And just to close about a collateral damage, in the book at the end, I humanize these three people, what they lost by dying and what we lost. JFK never got to play with uh, John, John and Caroline, never got to watch them grow up. We don't know what he would have done as, as president. Uh, hopefully he would have gotten us out of the, uh, the uh, Vietnam War, the civil rights, all of that. With, with uh, Marilyn Monroe, all she ever wanted to do was have a child uh, to be married again. And I've been able to find out now through new sources, and it's in, it's in collateral damage as well, that she planned to remarry Joe DiMaggio. And in fact, the wedding would have taken place on the very day of her funeral. And with Dorothy Kilgallen, the mother of three. She never got to play with those young kids. 
and she never got to watch them show uh, grow up. And we lost one of the greatest, most remarkable um, uh, reporters who ever lived. To get justice for these three, I've done everything I possibly can, and I'll do more. I got Cyrus Vance, the New York District Attorney, to look into the Dorothy's death, and then he dumped it, saying it was too expensive and all of that. I'm still after him and the New York Police Commissioner, who I flew to New York and met with, and, and supposedly has said he's going to look into it, but nothing there. I just sent two letters, an evidence report, and everything that I can uh, substantiating Marilyn Monroe's death to the Los Angeles County uh, District Attorney George Gaston. And with JFK's assassination, I'm, I'm continuing to try to get Congress to reopen that because we don't know the truth about exactly what happened then. I want them to bring in all of the evidence and make a determination that way. So it's all, all about justice for me. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping uh, that the collection that we have, which will include all of these books, research books, notes, videos, everything you can think of, will be fodder for students, teachers, and researchers who can take my research and, and move it forward and find out new material and, and come up with new conclusions. Maybe, maybe they'll, 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 those will be adverse to what I found. I have no fear of that. But that's, the, 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 that's what I hope will happen. And again, uh, I can't thank Purdue enough for the honor of your, your being able to archive my material. Well, Mark, how exciting to hear all of these stories and everything up to this point. And I know we'll talk later again about what comes next. But um, you, you actually answered some of my questions with your stories as you were walking through your life. But I do have one that I think will be per particularly pertinent to students and researchers which is really around the role of Freedom of Information Act requests that you must have made in your research process. How, how, have, how has that played in your research? Well, I'm glad you brought it up. It's just unbelievably frustrating for people. Uh, most of the time you don't even hear back from these, these individuals and you have to just continue though to send them in information, you know, information requests. You can't give up after one or two or three of them or whatever. And sometimes they do pay off. Uh, I will tell you that I think also one of the great resources for people other than the uh, Freedom of Information Act that way is the National Archives. I found Dorothy Kilgallen's autopsy there. I found more material on Maryland and JFK and all that. So that's a very good source. Um, when you do get information, uh, you get back material from the Freedom of Information request, so much of it is redacted. The pages just have all black on them and everything. But you just got to keep after it then. You have to write them and say, you know, how in the world can this be being kept with us, kept from us since 1962? The biggest sin right now is the fact that not just this president, but I don't know, five, six presidents before them, almost every president has all they've all said, yes, we're going to open up all of the JFK assassination files for you. And that has not happened today to date. And I doubt that it's going to happen in the future. There's something in there. I tend to believe it's about the JFK assassination, but also could be about Dorothy Kilgallen. When she died, her JFK assassination evidence file disappeared. I've requested it with no luck. I've got a feeling that it's in there and it shows the cover up by J. Edgar Hoover and all of that. My hunch is, um, Beth, that, that there may be somebody still alive from the Warren Commission, which was a joke as Dorothy Kilgallen wrote about, that they feel still could be in, in peril somehow or another. But this is 60 years later. So I'm hoping that at some point there'll be enough pressure put on, um, you know, uh, those in, in, of authority to, uh, to honor the requests that are being made. And I would really, uh, you, know, you know, I would really suggest that those people who get interested in this kind of thing uh, really, you know, don't give up. You don't give up in life. You just keep trying and trying and trying. Uh, but thus far, I've had mixed results, and I know other people have given up, and I hate to see that happen. Sure, and you know what? Um, persistence sounds like a true Purdue trait. We talk about that a lot here, but persisting. Um, one more question. Any advice on deep research you would give to students today interested in a career maybe as an investigative writer or yeah. reporter? Don't even open the page Wikipedia. <laughs> and that's too bad. It, for a long time, it was reliable, but I'm sure everybody knows anybody can go in there and put anything they want to now. So stay away from that. Stay away from internet sources and things like that. You, go to primary sources. Go to, you know, over, over here, I've, 
you know, I've got a, 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 a copies of the books that are, are going to be in the collection. Look at those books. They're reliable. I don't, I don't uh, quote from books unless I've got a, a primary source or I can confirm that information or whatever. But it's, it's a fascinating uh, possible career. I think investigative reporter uh, is, is something that people would really enjoy. Um, you know, and I, I, I shouldn't have, I should have mentioned this before. I'm so glad you brought this up. About a year ago, I decided to see if I could get a little smarter. So I wrote the bio, uh, I read the biographies of Michelangelo, Einstein, and um, Michelangelo, Einstein, and what's the other famous, uh, uh, famous uh, artist? Leonardo da Vinci? Yeah, Leonardo da Vinci. And I thought maybe if I read those, uh, I'll, I'll be smarter because these were, you know, three geniuses. Uh, and, and I don't think I have. But what I found out is there's one uh, trait that they mention in there in terms of success in their respective fields. And I think it works uh, with every field. That's curiosity. Being curious. Uh, in this day and age, you can't believe everything you see on television. Unfortunately, you can't read everything you, that's printed. You have to ask questions. This is one of the great problems that happened back in, in the early 1960s, and it happens to get, again today. Um, they didn't ask questions enough about JFK's death. They didn't ask questions enough about Marilyn Monroe's death or Dorothy Kilgallen's. If they had, then all of this material would have made a difference. History would have been changed. The, the course of history would have been changed because Bobby Kennedy would have been held responsible for, for being complicit in Marilyn Monroe's death. So today, you know, if you're a curious person at all, investigating reporter, we need people like Dorothy Kilgallen, uh, not just because I wrote about her, but I'd really strongly suggest, um, and, and I ask people to get in touch with me at markshawbooks.com and, and email me or whatever. Um, if, if there's a, a person at Purdue University interested in journalism and being a reporter, uh, you know, a um, investigative journalist or a reporter of some sort like Dorothy Kilgallen was, I'll give them a copy of The Reporter Who Knew Too Much. I'd be glad to do that. I'd be glad to speak about it there because that is, we're sorely missing that. You know, uh, we can't, we're not going to have actresses like Marilyn Monroe. And so we're, we're never going to replicate who she was or JFK. But we can find reporters like Dorothy Kilgallen. So uh, I'm, I'm an advocate for that and I would help any way I could. That's excellent. Thank you, Mark. Um, this is the really the conclusion of uh, the questions I have. We are grateful for the time you spent with us. We're very grateful for your collection. And of course, uh, so um, so pleased to always talk to Purdue alums. If I may, um, would you say then that, you know, be curious, persist, tell the truth and do your best might be uh, words of wisdom you would share? Yeah, you know, uh, when I was first, uh, when I first talked to uh, someone there and they called me a, a distinguished alumni, I thought they probably had the wrong person, but um, there's a connection here with me per, in Purdue and it's, mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I, I savor it so much. So any lessons learned that I have, and I've had ups and downs and up and down that I didn't even mention. Yes, I've had some successes, but you just gotta keep going and believe in something and have a passion for it and all of that. But those words that you just mentioned, yes, those are, those are the key words along with with, with curiosity of, curiosity. and again, let's go right back to that professor that saved me from possibly, you know, I just felt inferior. I really did. I didn't think I was smart enough. If you quit now, you'll be a quitter your whole life. And God bless him, wherever he is or whatever happened to him. Maybe one day we'll try to track that man down, but bless him. I agree. Uh, yes, we wouldn't be doing this talk today if you hadn't stuck around at Purdue. That's right. Mark Shaw, thank you very much. And I'm going to stop the recording. Thanks.